What is happening, everybody? Welcome back to Tour Life. Today is Tuesday, March 19th. We are going to jump in to the recap of the Open at the Aus- Open at Austin. Talk all about what went down in MPO, what went down in FPO. We actually have the Open at Austin first time on Tour Life joining us. Nicholas Antilla joins the show. Antilla. Nicholas oh. Antilla. I've heard so many different pronunci- pronunciations. We will get the official pronunciation. Pron- I can't even pronunciate. Pronunciate. We'll get the official one tonight when he joins the show. We did reach out to Own. I want to let everyone know we did reach out to Own. She did not see my Instagram d- uh, DM. Yuli, you tried to reach out to her as well. Um, I've tried before. She's she's busy. She's a busy gal. So yeah, I was gonna say she's a tough. She's a tough get. We'll eventually get her though. We'll get her. We didn't get her this week, she, but um, she told me before she needs a little planning, and yeah. I'm like, well, we can't plan when you win. Like we can't. We can't do that. Maybe we should. Uh, we'll get it, We'll get into that very soon. Here, uh, we also have the wild story of the week. Uh, we're gonna be bumping up Edwin's stats too because I feel like. Uh, Edwin made a good point. He said, Hey, a lot of the stats I have are stuff that you've already kind of discussed. So we're going to actually talk about uh, Edwin's stats almost at the top of the show to give us a little bit more context on some things that we can talk about in the recap. And then also talk about when Nicholas comes on. So I well, think I like that'll that. be, a, I think that'll be a good move. And then we've got some listener questions to end out the show, big show. But before we get into it, we do have a ad. So Silas, let's roll into that right now. Today's video is sponsored by Mudwater. All right, as some of you may know, I recently had a newborn baby. And with that comes lack of sleep and the need for energy. And here's the thing, energy drinks are not the best solution. You're, all that caffeine can make you jittery. It can get you some serious crashes. And that's why Mudwater is an excellent alternative. Mudwater is super, super simple to make and it gives a great boost of energy with natural ingredients. Each ingredient in this blend was added for a purpose. They've got cacao and chai for a hint of caffeine and a little bit of that hot chocolate flavor. Lion's mane for focus. Cordyceps to promote natural energy and both chaga and reishi to support a healthy immune system. Now, I know what you're thinking. Natural energy made up of mushrooms called mud water. How does it taste? I actually quite like it. I think it kind of tastes like a chai tea latte, which I really love. Like any kind of healthier uh, beverage, it was a little intimidating at first, but once I tried it, I realized I loved it. Making it is super easy. You just take a scoop of your mud water. I like to throw it in some hot water and mix it up. Like I said, has a great taste. I think those of you who are coffee drinkers could find this as an easy alternative. You still get that warm, yummy beverage. You can make this a ton of different ways. They offer other products like creamers as well to help sweeten things up. And I really like it just as it is as well. Smells good. Yeah, it does. Plus this thing is healthy, okay? This is certified USDA organic. It's Whole30 approved. It's vegan approved. It's gluten-free. It really checks all those boxes. So if you're looking to kick the energy drinks, find an alternative to that coffee and those jittery moments and those crashes that are associated with it like I was being sleep deprived with a newborn baby, Mudwater is a special offer that they're hooking up with our viewers with. If you go to mudwater.com slash foundation, you can get started for just $29. That's mudwater spelled M-U-D-W-T-R dot com slash foundation. You can get started for just 29 bucks. Thanks again to Mudwater for sponsoring this video. I'm gonna enjoy this mug. Bye. Ever for that, and uh, thank you, Budwater, uh, for sponsoring the Tour Life podcast. We appreciate all of our sponsors. All right, Yuli, how's it going, brother? It's Off good. Week. I'm, I'm back home, man. I'm so happy to be home. I, it's so nice. It's it's crazy how you you can com- kind of compartmentalize everything while you're on tour, and it just seems like another day, another whatever. And then, literally, every time I come home, I'm dead. Mm. Like I walk in the door, I literally, you know, have like a later flight because we're all the way across the country. So I get in at like eight, I come home, go upstairs and I sleep for like 14 hours. It's crazy. Oh, really? Almost every time. Like it's as soon as I get home, I'm able to just like crash out and finally get some sleep and mm. like nothing changes. The schedule's still the same. It's just, I don't know. My brain's finally like, okay, we're home. Like let's digress a little bit. Yeah, it's super nice. And, you know, obviously being a married man yourself, uh, you sleep easier when you're back at home yes. with the wife and everything. Mm-hmm. So 
Uh, it is it is very nice. It's a nice little off week here leading into Texas States <laughs> next week, which will be out in Houston. Uh, but yeah, this week, this past week, we were down in Austin, Texas, which I have to say, timing wise, I don't know if I love the idea of having the tournament during South by Southwest. I think you probably have a lot of maybe your fringe disc golf fans deciding to probably go to South by Southwest over a disc golf tournament. But that being said, I think Austin is an absolutely awesome spot for a disc golf pro tour event. And I'm very happy with, even though I love the tournament in Belton and I thought it was a cool course and they were doing a lot of awesome things to kind of make that course more pro tour standards, if you will. I think what they've done down here in Austin and the fans, it's been awesome. It's been really, really nice. No, I agree. I, I think the fans were great. The course was pretty good. I, I, I'm looking forward to the next couple of years, hopefully staying in one spot mm-hmm. and getting that course kind of dialed down. Um, because I, that was their plan all along, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Which I don't know if some people, I think some people I saw on the internet were saying like, Oh, it's, it's nice that the course designers saw some player feedback and may change. No, no, no. I talked to the course designer. He said this was the plan all along was to get in the woods to make these holes. It's just they didn't have enough time to do it last year. So I think we're going to start seeing more and more improvements, which, I mean, these guys know what they're doing. They make good holes. And uh, I'm very excited. Like you said, hopefully this tournament stays in one spot. Yeah. And we can kind of see it grow year after year. But how did, how did your week go down at the Open at Austin? It was good. It was a little disappointing. I went into the week playing really well. I felt like that. I don't think there's a different, there's a course that's better for me than that one, honestly, mm. out there. And I had another like little slip on a tee pad and practice and tweak my, my glute, my left glute. So I couldn't mm. throw very many sidearms, like no power sidearms at all, which is like, if you play that front nine, it's all sidearms pretty much. It's once you get in the woods for, for me, you can get away with throwing backhands as we saw a lot of great players do. Mm-hmm. But for me, like practicing it, I was throwing stock little Raptor flexes on like all those position holes mm. to get into position and my up shots and everything. And so that really hurt me. I came out of the front nine, I think for the tournament six over par, which oh, is wow. like not, that's not getting the job done. And I played the back nine extremely well, which I didn't think was my strong nine. Um, and that was pretty much it. I, I mean, I really feel like if I was, I've been throwing my sidearms better than I have for in years. So that was kind of a big blow to me. I, it was, re, it was doing really well in, at Waco and at the Memorial. Um, but uh, yeah, so that was basically it. I ended up tying like 75 people for last cash which I thought that I was tied for one out of the cash. So it's funny how after the tournament you can be all bummed and then you find out you made 95 bucks and you're like, Oh sweet. Uh, Yeah. I kind of did it this weekend. So it it was a, there was a small bright spot there. Mm. Um, It was great because I know what I need to work on. I think as we move forward in the year, courses are going to get longer. And with that, I don't have to rely on my sidearm as much. And I know what I have to work on with like my backhand and, and the control that I need to um, get with certain shots because there are a couple holes out there that required some nice distance and some c- controlled like flex shots and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that was it. I was happy with my play. I putted great again. I just need to, um, yeah, kind of have it all come together. I think I'm really close to having a great tournament. Oh, that was fantastic. Before the show started, we kind of talked a little bit how, you know, Friday was a pretty big wake up call for me because it was very calm. I got into town on Wednesday, so I got a practice round in on Wednesday and one in on Thursday. And both those days were fairly calm. And the wind picked up drastically on Friday. It also switched uh, directions of yeah. uh, where we were usually practicing. And I got a I got a very rude awakening of like, holy crap, I don't really know, or at least maybe not know is the right word. Maybe I didn't have the confidence in a lot of my discs on what they were gonna do in the wind. Cause I think when the wind gets that high, 
you really want to be throwing discs that you like, I know for a fact, this is not going to flip. Yeah. Cause it gets really scary when you're like, I'm 50, 50. So there was a lot of shots where I was like, I, I don't actually know what this to throw. And so that was a little bit frustrating at times. Um, but again, like the frustration, I can always just put it back to myself. So it's, it's not, it's not a crazy thing. It's something that I can work out with time. The other thing about this tournament that, uh, I, I was at least kind of working on a little bit is I was working on shots that I'm not very good at. So the straight standstill putter shot from 200 feet where you have to throw it through a gap, that is not my bread and butter. I would much rather be throwing a crazy scramble shot where I'm leaning out, throwing a sidearm yeah. through a gap. I feel like I'm going to hit that gap way more consistent in that way than the backhand. So I was working on some of those backhand putter shots and then hole 17, that might be the worst shape shot for me ever because you can't really get to the basket with a forehand flip up the way that the trees are aligned. Yeah. It is, and it's not really a throw a flippy disc. It is a hundred percent throw an over stable disc on a flex line backhand. And that is by far my worst shot. And so the first two days I was like, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. And I early released one straight OB left, took a double. The other one, I hit the tree that you're trying to miss. You know, you're trying to uh, turn off that tree, hit that tree, went OB. I think I took a bogey. Uh, I think I got up and down for a bogey. So the first two days I was like, I'm not playing well. Uh, on this hole third day I was like I'm doing it and I literally grabbed my disc and didn't take any time at all I was just like locked in on this is what I'm doing I didn't do any routine grabbed my disc from the bag walked up ran up through it threw it to like 27 feet and I was like heck yeah that is how you throw that shot now can I replicate it that is the question but I thought this course was great I thought it required a lot of different shots. The scrambling was really fun on a lot of these wooded holes. And then some of these open holes, you know, you look like a, you look at a hole, like hole number 10. This was the, the hole that Nick Loss aced, uh, Austin Turner aced and Trevin Trevin Crow aced as well. So three aces on the hole. And you think to yourself, Oh my gosh, this is the easiest hole ever. No, 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 no. That hole played very difficult for a lot of people. Yes. And it, w- it required a very specific shot depending on what the wind was. Now, did we like the drop zone there, Yuli? No. Like a 35 foot putt for par. I didn't like it, but a hole that you would look at normally on paper and be like, oh, this is like a musket birdie. It wasn't. It, that was a challenging hole. So I, I, I like the way the course was set up this year. Um, <laughs> I think it's heading in the right direction. I will say that I don't know if we want to get into this right now. I did play the wrong drop zone and ended up taking a pony stroke or two pony strokes on one of the holes. Should we, should we have literally a, a, a painted area and a sign that says drop zone that actually isn't our drop zone? What was it a drop zone for? FPO. Oh, well, no, should, I get it. I get it. it. Should, it's on me. It should say MPO or FPO on there. It should be like MPO drop zone, FPO drop zone for sure. It I, I get just it. Be it's, a drop zone. No, it's I agree. on me. I, was I kind of making a point? Maybe in the time I was kind of making a point of like, why do we have to play every hole and look at the caddy book to read the paragraph on how that hole plays? To me, there should be like a standardized rule of like how holes play. And we shouldn't like have to always be like, do we go to the FPO T pad for the drop zone? Or do we go to this drop zone for the drop zone? Do we advance if we cross OB or do we have, I, I don't know that maybe I'm on my pace of play rant again, but I do think that inf- a, 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 a affects pace of play is when every hole plays a little bit different from one another. No, I think, uh, I mean, it's tough because the facts are we play, we play the same course that's different, play on the same property that's different. So we're playing with two courses set up at all times. The basket's just not in. 
So there's all kinds of different tee pads. There's all kinds of different drop zones. There's all kinds of different mandos. There's all kinds of different drop zones for that mando. Like it can be definitely confusing. And I think standardizing it would be amazing. Are we there yet? Probably not. But at least yeah. have like MPO on the drop zone. MPO drop zone. FPO drop zone. That's I pretty easy. I love the different color tee pads too at yeah, Lake Waco. That was nice. Different color tee pads, whatever. All those things are are super important. And it can it can definitely get confusing. I mean, there's people in my group who didn't know where, where to go or what to do. And and for playing, me too, there's a lot of provisionals being played. Yes, yes. And and this isn't like a gripe on like I, guys. I was I was so far out of cash. I could I I didn't care if I was going to take a penalty stroke. A lot of this is it's like spectators. Yeah, they right. Don't know of either. like it's confusing of like what's going why wait what's happening and you know if this happened on coverage who knows what were you gonna say though. I was going to say the provisional is a, is a rule you can use to your advantage, which goes into this, which I saw a lot of comments in our last podcast about me not knowing the rules about uh, benefit goes to the player. Hold, I got hold, hold on on that because we're going to unless you want to talk about it now, I was going to add uh, we had a listener question that I think sums that up really well that I want you to respond to if you if you're OK with waiting. It's up to you though. Oh, I want to, I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to gripe, but okay. Yeah. I'll Should wait. I ask the question now and then you can respond? Yeah, How about yes, that? Please. Okay. Um, this is from William. He says, it sounds like Yuli does not have the correct understanding of the benefit goes to the player rule based on the last episode. The rule uh, states when a group cannot reach a majority decision regarding a ruling, the ruling is based on the interpretation that is most beneficial to the thrower. It does not establish a certain level of confidence required before voting yes or no. If player A throws out of bounds and players B, C, D are 50% sure you never crossed in bounds, they can still vote that way. And that is the ruling player A has to go with. Do you two think that rule should be updated to support Yuli's opinion of the rule? It is. It is supporting my opinion. This is what's hilarious. People listen to what I say and they're like, oh my gosh. 1% 1% goes to the benefit goes to the player. It's a hundred percent true because here's the thing. If we don't see the disc cross and bounds, nobody has an opinion. Nobody can be like, no, I for sure shot, saw it. Like that's, that's a thing. It's a spotter says it, th- there's a spotter there because it's hard for us to tell mm-hmm. if I'm in a group, which I am and you guys aren't, <laughs> This is the way that it works. I go, wow, I'm pretty sure I crossed. If I think I crossed, damn near 100% of the time, my group is going to be on board with me. Dang near. How many times, Brody, have you thrown a shot and been like, I think I crossed, and your whole group's like, not even close, dude. Scram. It doesn't happen like that. Like, that's not a real scenario that happens in our game. In In real life scenarios... When you're having in a disagreement with, it's typically a spotter. It's usually not your group because we're all on the same board of being like, no, benefit goes to the player. Like it was pretty close. Like you probably get it. And once in a while, there's one person. I have never been in a group where three people told me no chance. And I argued, I go like this. All right, deal done. I'm taking it back here. I I don't have an argument, right? But when there's a discrepancy, the benefit goes to the player. Even if it is 1%, 1%. Yeah, it might not be technically, I guess, with what William's saying, is it might not be technically what the rule says, but the way <laughs> no. that it works on the pro tour and like how, you know, yes. we all play with you one, one other, you know, week after week. If, if we're not 100% sure, if we can't say, no, man, I saw that disc hit the water. It never crossed. If we can't say that the majority of players on tour are going to say, well, we'll, we'll say you crossed. That's Mm -hmm. just how it works. Now, the one thing that I always push back on is if we are standing hole 18 is a perfect example at, at Waco. Everyone knows that hole. The spotter is standing on the shoreline. They're looking down the shoreline. We are at an angle to the shoreline. Our vantage point also we're, you know, 400 feet away. The spotters 50 to hundred feet away. They're much closer. They have a much better view of what the disc is doing than us. So the way I always do it is like, I'm just going to have faith and trust in what the spotter saw. 
because if I don't, if I can't say one way or the other, because of the way of where I'm standing and the spotters telling me you a hundred percent did not cross. I have to have faith and trust that that spotter is calling it the same way for every player. And if we all take the spotters ruling in that situation, now it's different though, Yuli, if that spotter is 250 feet away and has a bad vantage point, then I think it's up for grabs. But if he's standing on the line and he's literally looking to see like if your disc cra- cra- that's where I have an issue when a player walks up and is like, no chance. Look where my disc is. There's no chance it didn't cross. It's like, bro, this guy's saying it didn't cross. I don't know what you want me to say. And it comes that, down, that's, it, that's it my comes point. down to the group too. Like the spotter has no- nothing to do with it. Literally nothing. If you don't Correct. want him to, it's the group. And when that stuff happens and you look at your group and you go, I think I crossed. Typically, first of all, not a lot of people pay attention anyway. And there's going to be yeah. one guy who says, didn't see it. And there's going to be another guy who says, I don't think you crossed. And then another guy goes, I don't know. And then it's a spotter against me against that guy. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's the way that it works in that situation. Benefit goes to the player. So when I hear all these comments about Paul doesn't know the rules. No, I've played more tournaments than any person has ever played on the pro tour. That's fact. I have experience with this stuff. That's not how it works. The rule can read the way it it reads, but in certain situations, it's a lot harder than you think. And in those cases, I would rather have benefit go to the player than the opposite period, because then you can completely flip the script and be like, okay, so if you know that it crosses 100% and a hundred people see it and you have people in your group telling you, you didn't cross, and you actually did now you're getting screwed and it's fine. So it's yeah. a rule. It's a rule that is like, it's not as easy as people think it's not black and white at all. And we also take, you know, we take spectators and fans sometimes, right? We'll walk up. And if someone's like, Oh yeah, you definitely cross in bounds that do- even though that shouldn't have any impact on our, um, on our vote of whether or not it did cross in bounds, it does. If you 100%. walk up in a spot in a spot and you hear a spotter say, Oh yeah, he definitely crossed in bounds. It's really hard at that point to be like, no man, I don't think you cross the bounds. Exactly. So, yeah. I mean, there was a, uh, last year at the Memorial, I threw a shot on hole one. Didn't look like it crossed at all. We get up there. I play provisional from the drop zone, get up there. The spotter goes, Paul, you 100% cross in bounds. And my group's like, Dude, that wasn't even close. And he goes, I've been sitting here all day. I saw it crest right here. It was a good three feet in bounds. And my group's like, uh, okay. So he takes it here then. And I'm like, yeah, Heck yeah. it's tough not to, you know, it's really, I mean? it's, it's really tough. It, you normally don't ever see that get no. reversed. The ones that you see get reversed is when the spotter saying you did not cross yep. and the players fighting for you did cross that's cause you're never going to disagree with the spotter and be like, no, 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 I definitely didn't cross. Right. You're always going to be like, well, if the spotter is saying I cross, I guess I crossed. And it's, it's the opposite, which is, so, I think that's so, the one that I have the biggest right. disagreement. And with. what I was explaining last week, and I'll restate it again. If you think you're discross and the spotter says, no, that's when I say, are you 100% sure it didn't cross? And if to he the says, spotter? yeah. And if he says, no, then he's yeah. void. He's void. Yeah. And now I guess, goes I guess. Yeah. That's guess. the 1%. You go, mm-hmm. are you, are you 100% sure that it didn't cross? And if he goes, it was pretty close all of a sudden now benefit goes to the player in your group, right? Because he has the best vantage point. You look at your group, you can't really see it. And now you have an argument. Yeah. That's the way that works. Yeah. All right, we have Nick Loss coming uh, in about five minutes or so. But before we get him on here, I want to let you guys know that something something that we're doing over at Foundation Disc Golf, we're trying, we're testing this out. We're seeing how it goes. And so far, the people that have joined have really enjoyed it. So I wanted to share that with you guys. We are thrilled to introduce our exclusive weekly text deals that offer incredible discounts on your favorite discs, merch, and, and accessories. Get ready to score amazing savings and elevate your collection. Each week, our team handpicks from our inventory or places a specific order to find the best deal we can possibly offer. We text you a limited time offer on the on hand uh, selected items. 
text us back with how many of the discs slash item you want and your order is in. It's just that easy. If you're on your phone, click the link in the description or text the word join to one 255 8270 Text the word join to one 255 8270 and you will get signed up today. And, uh, you know, if you love great deals on this, that's where, uh, you'll just have them literally texted to your phone. I don't, did I throw that in the description Silas or do I need to do that right now? I don't remember if I do that in there. All right. I will add that into all of our, uh, YouTube people right now. So you guys have that in the description. Um, I can uh, put this actually right here for you guys in chat too. There you go. Boom. Get some uh, get some cool de deals texted your way. Um, all right. Anything else, Yuli, to rack up, wrap up your uh, your Waco experience? Or sorry, gosh, Waco. Your um, open at Austin. No, no, that was it, man. I had a blast. It was a good week. Uh... Were you affected by the delay on Sunday at all? I mean, I had to wait for my tea time, but not you got, really. You, you hadn't teed off yet? You got pushed I, back? No, I just got pushed back, so I, I didn't have to go out there and come off or anything. But, I mean, it was weird not being able to play all the holes. I will give a shout-out to whoever said get rid of the three holes because that was perfect for the ending, almost. It could have been two holes, but uh, them getting rid of the three holes, it seemed like it timed timed pretty well for the whole tournament to be able to I, finish it was like yeah, right i don't know how much more time they would have had it, would it was have. getting pretty dark because at first i'm like dude they're gonna be able to finish the whole thing why can't we just play all the holes is they were, what i was thinking and the card was pretty far behind every other card yeah yep. so <laughs> they were they were oh man yeah they were uh they were a good two cards behind the, the funny the funny thing about that and we'll, we'll we'll talk about this a little bit later on after nicholas gets off but there was a funny inter uh i don't know if you saw that um interaction between austin hannum and uh jeff spring where i i think i was on the second or third card out that final day and we were like if we skip these holes because fpo wasn't skipping fpo played all 18 we we're like we like we're gonna jump FPO. Like, we'll we'll skip because uh, that is that is an issue. That is an issue that they need to figure out. Is FPO almost every day blocks up the entire course, so MPO catches up with Lee Card FPO almost every round. And I I would know because I'm playing I'm playing a lot of times on these cards <laughs> that are that are catching up to FBO. So that is something that they they're going to have to try to figure out of how do we how do we get these rounds done quicker because you know we can't be having some cards playing around in three and a half hours and some cards playing around in three hours. It's just it's just not going to work. Um, all right. Edwin stats. I don't know if I really want to jump too much into this before we get Nicholas on. Cause he's about to jump. So I think we maybe do, uh, or maybe we can kind of discuss some of this stuff while Nicholas jumps on. Cause a lot of this stuff honestly is, is from him. So we can maybe use some of this stuff. Um, we can maybe use some, I'll, I'll maybe pull some of this stuff up when uh, we're talking about it. Cause some of this stuff actually here is very, very exciting, but we're not going to make him wait any longer. The first ever Finnish player to win on the disc golf pro tour. Niklas Antilla now joins tour life for the first time. Welcome brother. Sounds good. Thank you, boys. I was going to say, how's that intro sound? Very nice. That has been my dream for like five, four years now. And, it's funny true, so I still can't believe it, but I think I started to like understand what happened and move forward. Yeah, that's one of those cool ones that will stick with you for the rest of time and even like in the future, you know, 40 years, 50 years from now, if another Finnish player starts making moves on the tour, everyone will look back to you as the first. So you're kind of submitted into history there winning that one. So yeah. uh, very, very cool. Um, I want to jump in first to just kind of get your mindset because this isn't 
this isn't new to you having a chance to win. You've been in positions multiple times and multiple times you've fallen just short. Yeah. What, what was the feeling going into the lead round? Did you have any feelings like, Hey, this is different. Yeah. Uh, obviously I was second uh, last week in Waco as well. So I kind of fell short again and I felt like, all right, we had one more second place again. And I was just telling myself that I just can't keep like being second all the time. If I get like any more chances, I want to dig deep and like take all my chances and use them as my advantage. And uh, uh, of course, I missed the pattern 14 again. Um, and I was feeling like, is it happening again? But I was able to make those two parts in the in the last two holes and win it like if I think like how I want to win, I want to win like by making a 35 four or so that was super nice. Yeah, it was very impressive what you did. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. I don't want to jump too far ahead because some crazy stuff happened in a very, very short period of time. You, I, I I'm trying to get the timeline just right. And Yuli or uh, either one of you, I guess, jump in. You got a uh, warning for excessive time, which has now happened twice. Back-to-back -to -back tournaments, lead card, Ganon Burr at Waco, and now you at the Open at Austin. And then did you end up missing a kind of a short putt shortly after that? Yeah, I got the time warning on round one. I think it was hole eight uh, on my second shot. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Uh, of course, I was playing a bit faster after that, and I was kind of rushing my shots, I felt like. Uh, and I missed like a, maybe like 14, 15 foot putt on, on hole nine. So, yeah, it was in my mind that I need to play fast, and I didn't want to even come close to 30 seconds and any of my shots. But, yeah, and then on hole, on hole 10, I played one hole in 10 seconds, so that was fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so for those that didn't see it, we'll actually pull up the clip here in a second. Not yet right now, size, because I do want to get your thoughts on uh, on that. But this brings up my like pace of play situation. I, I'm curious to see what you, your thoughts are on it. I think the 30 second rule is one of the dumbest rules we play. And I'll tell you why. You could have all four people on your card take 29 seconds for every single shot. They have a five foot putt. They take 29 seconds. You could do that, and there would be no rules that you could call against this card. They're playing by the rules, and they would yeah. they would back up the entire course. It would be an absolute nightmare to play behind a card like that. So like what you just said, you start playing a lot quicker, and you took 10 seconds to play one hole. Do you think? Do you like the way the rule is currently set or would you like to make it to where hey there's certain shots that i'm going to need a little bit more time but when i get to a 20 foot putt i'm not going to take 30 seconds i'm going to take 10 and that's going to kind of catch us back up to how fast we should be playing yeah i think um especially in this golf if you go to like a deep rough uh you will easily take like 45 seconds on a shot but then again if you have like a 250 foot high street shot, like nothing on your way. I think you should take like only 10, 15 seconds to maybe look at the wind and stuff. Um, I don't know what I think about like the 30 second rule. I think it's all right, but there is definitely like situations where it's, it's really bad as well. And uh, for me, it's just like, because I got the time warning from like um, DJPT staff member, not a player. Yeah. And then I was not the only one using like over 30 seconds on one shot. And the same guy was there for the whole round. And I was the only guy who got the warning. So I think that's that's like, I felt a little bit dumb about that because especially with the same guy being like following us on the, on the whole round. Yeah, I think the clip that, uh, or the, the shot that you ended up getting it, I think you ended up taking roughly around 50 seconds. And yeah. it's like, the rule is, if, if we're really calling the rules out here, like you said, any, any time over 30 seconds should be called, whether it's 31, 32, or uh, a minute and a half. And Gannon was on last week, and he was talking how 
he was asking the guy, like, when does my 30 seconds start? Like, I would like to know when my 30 seconds, and the guy couldn't give him a clear answer. And I think that's a big issue too. A lot of people are looking specifically on how long, you know, how long are you taking to throw your shot, right? Are you doing a bunch of pump fakes? And my thing is like, I actually don't think that's the big issue here. I think the big issue is how long are you staying on the T pad and talking before yeah. the, the next person's throwing? How long is it taking you to walk the 450 yeah. feet to your T shot? Like, are you yeah. just walking the park doing this? Because I can get to my T shot in 20 seconds and there might be some people taking a minute and that's, yeah. those are massive gaps. Um, Yuli, what are your thoughts on, on how, you know, do you like the 30 second rule or do you want, do you think what needs to be changed? Cause no, we're I seeing it now I, affecting multiple tournaments. Yeah. I can't stand it. Um, one of the things is I think we should all get like a minute. I think there should be a minute because then it wouldn't even matter. And I think you should get an extension of your minute as well. And I've had a lot of pushback of that be people being like a minute. That's crazy. And I'm like, yeah, but people are taking a minute anyway. That's my whole thing. Like I don't have, mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with taking 30 seconds to throw I'm a fairly quick player, but there's times when the wind picks up and I'm putting where I, I'll use a little extra mm -hmm. time and I don't get called for it because I'm typically a a quick player and I'm not sitting there counting. Like I have an internal clock. That's like, okay, this is taking a little bit. This is taking a little while. Um, I should probably pull the trigger. And then I do, you know, once that internal clock is like, okay, I'm taking the excessive time. I have that. I think every player has that. And if it was a minute, we wouldn't have to worry about it. And then it comes down to what I think if you had a minute, what it should be is here's how long it should take you to play around. If you're, card is not keeping up with that pace of play your card gets the warning your whole card like hey you guys you guys need to pick it up as a card and then if it's just one player you can be like well it's him and then it's like well it doesn't matter you guys you guys need to keep going you guys need to get keep up the pace or whatever and a, a lot of people don't like that too because it could be just one player but at the same time it's all about pace of play. So what is the correct pace of play for your card to keep moving? So you're not backing up the whole entire place. If you get in the woods and you have a tough lie, it would, if you don't take the proper amount of time to find the right route, to know where the basket is, to know where your layup is, it could take triple the time you hit a branch right in front of you, rushing your shot. And now all of a sudden you're <laughs> back in the woods again. And now you take another 30 seconds. You don't yeah. have time to go look out. You throw it out of bounds. You rethrow, you throw out of bounds again. All of a sudden you just took four minutes <laughs> because you didn't take your time. You know what I mean? And that's yeah. something that people aren't thinking about, but that's, that's for real. When you kick really wildly in the woods, especially on a course like Waco, like you're in a spot that you have no, like no clue what's going on and you've never been there. It's not like people are just marching into the woods being like, Oh, if I hit this tree, I'm going to go 50 feet in here. And now I got to figure out how to get out. So I think there's a lot of different, um, different things, but I think what it comes down to is pace of play for, for the whole tournament, not just individual players. Yeah. Individual players should be a, a, allowed to have an allotted amount of time so that they can best perform best perform and give the people who are watching at this point, because that's what it is. It's a product that people need to be able to pay attention to and see and perform and get the best for whatever they're paying for. And the two things I was going to add to that, Nicholas is like for the, the, that specific instance where you took, you know, 50 seconds or whatever, if you would have sprinted off the T pad and gotten to your disc, right. I think the 50 seconds would have not slowed down. Like by the time you're throwing, the card is probably just showing up. So I think that's another thing is like, if you know, like you're going to be the first one to throw on your card, you, you had the worst tee shot. You're going to be the first one to throw and you're the last one off the tee pad. And you're like slowly getting, mm -hmm. that's, that's a major issue. Now I did want to ask you about the caddy situation. Did you have a caddy during that round? Uh, round one, I didn't have a caddy. I only had caddy for uh, the last round. Okay. And was that Tomas? Yes. Okay. I think that also plays a role because I think when we're watching it live, when you're, I can see your brain 
and I'm I'm trying to speculate what you're going through. Oh, is mm -hmm. he trying to throw like an overstable like a uh, flex shot to like flat, or is he thinking about maybe throwing a forehand? Like I'm kind of trying to understand what you're going through, but because you don't have a caddy there and you're not verbally talking it out, I think it feels like a long 50 seconds. Yeah. If you would have had Tomas there and you guys are talking and you're like pulling one disc out and he's like, ah, I don't like, I think for a viewer that 50 seconds goes by super fast. And then honestly too, like I, I think that's super interesting. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I want to hear that. And so I think that's something too, with the coverage of maybe when we do get caddies, maybe when we do get mics to where we can hear you guys like that to me is I would love to hear 40 seconds of you breaking that shot down. Like, I think that yeah. would be fascinating to, to everyone. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. It's, it's, it is going to be an issue because we've had, we've had a lot of these tournaments now where we're almost playing glow golf. Uh, did you have a glow disc in your bag just in case? Yeah, I had multiple. I had like three at least. Okay, so you were prepared. <laughs> I, yeah, I want to uh, say one thing to the 30 second rule. I think that the problem is not if somebody is using like 35 seconds on one shot. So there is some people that are slowing, like moving like so slowly on a course. Like, there has been so many times that people throw their T shots and then we watch the disc. And then I have been by his disc for like one minute and the same guy is still on the tee by drinking something or eating something or talking to somebody. I think that's the problem. Not, not like the 35 seconds on one shot. Yeah. And I'll put it out there. I've played with you a couple times. Now you are by far not a slow disc golfer. So mm -hmm. I just want to stop that narrative. I don't think that narrative is starting, but uh, yeah. if, if there are people out there being like, Oh, he got a time violation. He's slow. No, 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 he's not. He, mm -hmm. he plays very quick. And uh, what I like to call like ready disc golf of where you know, Hey, it's my turn. I'm going to throw and we're not sitting around waiting. Um, all right. Did you happen to see the sports center clip? Yeah. Yeah. I saw it. Okay. And I heard it. All right. We're going to play it here. Cause I want to get your reaction. Oh, that link. Uh, how much time do you need for it to just pull up? Oh, we don't have a way of just pulling it up real quick. Okay. Oh, um, okay. It doesn't have to be like super nice. You can just pull it up literally on like, if, uh, like if you want, it's just on Twitter. I, I, I just texted it to the group. Um, all right, we'll, we'll talk, we'll move on to something else and then, uh, we'll come back to that. Cause I do, I do want to get, I want everyone to hear it first and then get your reaction on it. Um, all right, let's, let's, let's fast forward a little bit to the final round. Let's go back to the final round real quick. Hole number six. That was one of those holes where the way I thought about it, I thought it was a very well-designed hole because of the shaping of it. And if you weren't able to get clean off the fairway, it was very, very tough to get your second shot to the basket. Were you trying, like, were you thinking about getting to the basket on that second shot there? Cause it did look like you threw a fast disc. Yeah. Um, thinking about it now, I made a dumb decision on that one. Uh, I was going with like PD2, which is like 12 speed driver. I was saying like, not go for the basket, but like skip it like behind the corner and then have like a 120 feet to the basket for easy par. I should have just like went with slow disc and just played for like 220 feet. Um, but yeah, that was a double bog and that one not ideal and that made me like work harder for the for the last hose. Do you like that kind of course design though of where? It's not all like gas. I feel like a lot of courses we play on tour. And I mean, you saw it on this course too, a little bit, right? When the wind was down, Gannon shot the course record at 14 under. Yeah. You had some really good rounds uh, as well. You were pretty consistent from round to round. But mm -hmm. like, do you feel like all of a sudden the first, I mean, that those first five holes, right? It's like gas. Like you got yeah. a birdie, you got to try to eagle hole five. And then you get to this hole here and you throw one bad shot and you're like, well, I got to still try to burn. Like, is that, was that a hard transition in the moment for you to be like, wait a second. Like if I just chip, chip, get a par and move on, all things are fine. 
Yeah, that was that was weird because I felt like, as you said, first five holes are like pretty simple, nothing too special on those, and then hole six and hole eight. I think you need to like almost like survive those holes, and you are happy with a par on those holes. And as you can see, like the double bogey happened so fast. Yeah, and, it did. Uh, and then again after hole eight, I feel like the end of the course is like pretty simple, and mm -hmm. then maybe seventeen and eighteen are like more stuff so it's like mentally mentally pretty hard to go like first play easy, easy for five holes and then go to woods and then come back and you need to be strong yeah i didn't really think about it at the time when we were playing but now looking back and talking about it like it's actually a really interesting design of where you got a score really good and then they throw like a speed bump at you yeah and then you got to score really good again and then at the end it's like Cause you can, you can rattle off. I mean, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, you can Eagle. Like you can rattle off a whole bunch right there. And then you get to 17, 18. And if you like slip up a little bit, all of a sudden you can take some big numbers. So yeah. uh, it ended up playing kind of well, I guess. Yeah. And I think that for example, I think I had a six on hole six and uh, Joey on my card had a three. So that was, three strokes on one hole and then hole eight he took a double bogey and i buried it so it happened right like super, super fast yeah yeah hey that just shows all the commentators out there this is everyone's big pet peeve when they're listening to commentators uh mm -hmm. not you yuli the live commentators it's okay to not have to like be the first one to say the tournament's over like they, it's like a weird, like contest. Like they want, like they want to have, be the first one to be like, Oh, that's it. Nick Luss is done. <laughs> like as soon as you hit that tree and you go OB, it's like, well, he's done. He's got no chance to win. He's completely out of the tournament. It's like, yeah. hold on, man. Like we're not playing these tournaments where, you know, everyone's shooting 16 under there's, there are some, you know, score separation here. So hold your horses. I thought, I thought you bounced <laughs> back from that, uh, that double early. I mean, your round could have been, you know, could have gone the exact opposite direction. Yeah. Um, so that was very impressive. Okay. I think we do have the clip now. So for those that didn't see it, this is, uh, uh, your ace on hole uh, 10, and it made Sports Center top 10 plays. Let's give it a watch. On number right. six, disc golf, Linda. Okay. This is the Pro Tour. Uh, Nicholas Antilla. What the heck is this? On hole 10, 315 feet out. It's like the pickleball yeah. of golf. <laughs> exactly. Just don't take up any real golf courses. Yeah, exactly. Got 150 oh points. He so sits in third place. Good for him. Okay. So, first reaction I want from you is like, Let's let's act like you saw that in a bar and you couldn't hear the commentary. What was your reaction when you found out that you were you made Sports Center top ten? I'm assuming this is the first time. Uh, that was awesome. That's actually my second time. I think oh. I made it. I was also number six in 2022 for finals when I made the uh, Long Eagle uh, on. Oh yes, okay. Fifteen maybe. Yes, yes. So that was a sick shot. Very cool. Okay. I yeah. didn't know that made Sports Center. Very nice. So, yeah, of course, that's really awesome. Uh, I felt like I was pretty lucky, though. It was like too much right, and I was going OB by a mile, but I'm lucky that I went in and I went one by one. So, that was important. <laughs> I think that's literally how all three aces, like if they didn't hit the basket, they were just going to be 50 feet right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's talk about the commentary now. So uh, I'm blanking on who the commentators, I think it's, um, gosh, I have to remember who her, what her name is. She's been on ESPN for a very, very long time. Both of them have been. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are your thoughts? And, you know, it wasn't the most positive commentary on that shot. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I don't really care. But when I think about it more, I think... It makes me feel a little bit sad because if this golf is somebody's like passion and they really like to do it, and then they hear like somebody talking about it in that way, I don't, I don't feel very good about that. Uh, maybe that's the only thing that I have to say about that. Pretty sad. Uh, it's Linda Cohen, by the way. That thank you, thank you to Brian for uh, letting me know. Yeah, I, I'll touch on that real quick, and then Yuli, I want you to hop in because I'm curious what your thoughts are. I think sometimes like it, this kind of just puts in perspective a little bit 
because we get in that disc golf bubble sometimes Mm -hmm. it kind of puts in perspective a little bit of just like there are you know these massive top four sports and and really if you're not even in one of the top four sports you could still be a huge sport yeah you still like there is still this kind of weird commentary towards a lot of sports that are much much bigger than disc golf the way I view it though, cause I know like, you know, you, you seemed like you were a little sad about it and there's a bunch of people on Twitter and Instagram that are upset. The way I view it is you're still getting disc golf in front of new eyeballs. And yeah. would it be better if they were like, Holy cow, this sport looks incredible. This the game. Yes. That obviously would be better, but someone still allowed it to get sports center top 10. So at a certain point, like we still have to be grateful that we got that spot. Now, what yep. do we do to be able to try to get, because ultimate Frisbee had the same kind of stigma of like, Oh, that's like a stoner sport. That's what a bunch of like people that smoke weed and go play Frisbee do. Yeah. And it took, I think it took a long time. And even still, some people think that I think disc golf is still very young, but y- Yuli, what are your thoughts on it? I think it's like uh hit and miss really with who's who's announcing it what they had for breakfast that day it (laughs) really is because they're seeing this and they and they have to come up with something on the fly Mm -hmm. and that's sometimes tough especially with something you probably haven't seen before um there's been times where i've made the top 10 and it was awesome and there's been times when they made complete fun of me so it, (laughs) it one of the clips they said that i threw it 427 yards which is like the world record, which is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was, that was hilarious, but they like really hyped it up. And another one, they're like, uh, what is this uh, Frisbee golf? And they like kind of made fun of me in, in the thing. And I'm with you, Brody, the more eyes that are on it, the better. But I also think we got to give the commentators a little break because they have a tough job of all of a sudden they don't probably know what's going to pop no, up and they just have just to pop right up mm-hmm. whatever comes to their mind. And so if I'm doing that and let's say it's like, the throwing marbles world championship. And I have to commentate on something I've never seen before. I probably, whatever comes to mind comes to mind. I don't think we should take it too seriously. Probably. I don't know. I mean, I haven't watched sports in a really long time, but I don't know if they do it like they used to. They basically would film one. And then I think they would re-record a couple of times. So like you would get a different iteration of, and the top 10 throughout the day would sometimes change too. Like some would drop off and new clips from that day would pop in. And so you would sometimes hear uh, the same person. They're now seeing it for the third time. And so I don't know if we have any other clips of that, Nicholas, but you might have another clip from that that is a little bit more positive that maybe yeah. you can put in your your memory bank hopefully for you um yes. but uh but no very cool i mean it's always very cool to see disc golf on tv like that um yeah and uh wh- whether it's a, in a positive light or not there are some kids i'm sure out there watching that to be like oh that looks sick i want to go try that so very very yeah. cool to see all right let's jump ahead now to hole 14. Now you you know you're not going to end up playing the next two holes, which are pretty pretty much most of us are are thinking those are birdie holes. You're going from hole 14 straight to 17 to 18. You have you play hole 14 absolutely perfect. You throw a great tee shot, put yourself in a good position. You throw a great up shot to give yourself what are we calling it? 15, 18 feet maybe 15 14 it's it was close i was trying to give you the Eight. benefit i was trying to give you the <laughs> benefit trying. out there nick class you could have been like ah 18 20 um, it was close now did you did you do one or two extra pumps there like was that a little bit of a longer routine than your he normal did putting extra routine pumps let's not give them any more breaks <laughs> <laughs> did yeah, you stand just... over that putt a little longer than you would normally stand over a 15 footer uh, yeah, a little bit. There was uh, some people moving behind, and that's not a, like an excuse for that one. It's like 15 foot putt. We should make it every time. Uh, I knew the scores before that putt, and I knew that if I was going to birdie out, uh, I was going to win by one, I think, at that point, uh, if Kai was going to birdie 18. So I knew the situation, and um, yeah, it kind of remind- 
reminded me of what happened in Winthrop in 2022. Uh, it was actually the same hole as well, hole 40, yep. I think. Yep. Yeah. Um, and that, to me, like, the whoa, way whoa, you... Whoa. Oh, what, yeah, went through, what was going through your mind? Was it the pressure? And so you had all those thoughts. You had the people behind there, and you're sitting there over it trying to obviously block the negative thoughts out for a second. At what point – because I feel like people who are listening don't understand, like, the thought process mm-hmm. that goes into situations like that. Like, at what point were you like, okay, this is – I got to pull the trigger? And where was your mind at once you did that? was it in the right place or was it just like you rushed it at that point because you didn't take long enough? Cause it's okay to sit there and mm-hmm. do 50 pumps as long as you make it. Yeah. Um, I think I, I took like a great amount of time. Uh, I wasn't rushing anything or, or stuff like that. I just felt like my head was empty uh, at that time. I felt like mm-hmm. I was, I didn't have any nerves, but I wasn't like, excited or anything about about anything really at that point i felt like i was just like in that moment but at the same time i was somewhere else uh, mm-hmm. it was it was weird now walking off that green what's going through your head as you, as you make the walk the whole 17 first off already kind of a weird situation right because we're normally walking uh much shorter distance and then off to the right so now we're doing something that we haven't done where we're yeah. walking we're skipping two holes and walking to another hole what what are the thoughts running through your head with two holes to play and after looking at scores and knowing hey if i birdie uh the last three holes i win taking a par there and i want to add to that knowing that there's three holes gone now being the leader to start the tournament, that could be like, oh, sweet, no more holes. Like, mm-hmm. I have a, I have the lead and we're getting rid of holes. That's a good thing for me. But at this point, you're pro- was there any thought of like, dang it, I wish I had those holes back? Just to um, add that question. Yeah. They really took away like the two of the, maybe the easiest holes on the course, uh, 15 and 16. Those were pretty simple holes. Um for me, 17 is like su- surprisingly easy because I like to throw those flex lines and I I felt pretty comfortable on that on that one. Um, we got to hang out there, Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking before you came on. I was like, that is my least favorite shot to throw on disc golf. Yeah, I just feel like <laughs> I'm just like smacking something over stable and I feel like I almost never miss those shots, uh, honestly. But yeah, I threw it to like 50 feet. It wasn't the greatest shot ever, but I gave myself a look and that's the that's the number one thing in those situations. Did you feel like you pulled that tee shot? Because as I was doing commentary, it looked like you threw it and you your eyes were like on it like right away, like, oh no, I pulled it a little bit, or did you peer it? Um it was a little bit too much right and a little bit too low. I think it was, a, was like a bit higher. It would have some time to like come back and maybe skip a little bit more on the left. Um it was a good line, but just a, a bit too low, I think. Okay. Now the putt you made on 17, that's, that's got to go down as one of the nastiest putts we've seen in a while. Uh, you know, it brings me back to like Paul McBeth's putt that he made at worlds on hole 17, um, where he's just cashing. I mean, his, his putt on at USCGC on hole set, we've seen some big putts before, after missing that short one on the previous hole, was it looking back at it? Was it actually nice to have like a 50 footer instead of having like another 20 footer right again, oh, right away? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I would have taken the 20 footer again. Uh, much rather <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was so far. And uh, also it was pretty dark at that time. So, I didn't see the basket as good as, as good as I maybe wanted to, but uh, I knew that if I want to have a chance to win the tournament, uh, I need to make that pass. And because we didn't have any time for playoff or stuff, because it was getting so dark so fast. Had they mentioned any of that to you guys during the round? Uh, like, were you guys getting updates on what they were going to do? Because so many of you guys were so close mm-hmm. together. Uh, no, I didn't know anything. All I knew that uh, we were going to play 15 holes, and that's it. I wonder if they would have just like brought out some like cars to hole one and just thrown the headlights on the basket. Yeah. That could have been like, electric. Yeah, but 
even if we like tied with Kyle, it would have been like two winners maybe, if that even a thing. Oh, yeah. you think they would have yeah. done co co champion? Yeah, and that's like they did with, with Ricky and Calvin that one year. Mm. At yeah, Ledgestone, I think. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to have like my first win to be like no. co champion. No, no, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let, let's uh, let's go to hole eighteen. So you birdie that hole. You're standing. You know, you're walking to the tee pad. Are you looking at scores? Are you seeing w where you stand? Yes, I know the situation, and also uh, I was playing with Gannon. Uh, he told me that, "Hey man, he's like we are always doing this thing. Hey man, <laughs> hey, hey man, you need to birdie 18 to win. Let's do it." And he was like cheering me on and stuff. Um, and I'm really thankful for him. We have been fighting for like a couple of tournaments in the past, and it was really nice to see that he is like cheering for me in that moment. Yeah, and you just absolutely throw the absolute perfect shot on on hole eighteen. That was beautiful. Did you? Did you? Was that your play all all three rounds to be that aggressive off the tee, or were you a little bit more aggressive knowing that you have to birdie that hole? I was even more aggressive on, on round one. I think I threw like PD and I know now I threw FD. So that's like seven speed. Okay. Uh, I went OB, OB right on round two. So I was going just like a bit more stable. So I can go like a bit more flatter and yeah, I threw it very good. Yeah, it was, it was incredible. And then like you said, I think the way you ended it with that big, uh, you know, 35 footer, I think that is to me, that's like the icing on the cake versus, you know, you throwing your upshot to five feet. I'm sure you would yeah. take both, but looking yes. back at it, knowing that if you were going to make both of them, the 35 footer, let's be real. Like that was epic. The emotion that you showed after making it, like what, what is all that like going through? I mean, you're, you're not like a, you're not like an old guy. It's not like you've been on yeah. tour trying to win forever. So like, wh where did that emotion come from? Um, I think there's many things that like affect the moment. I think also the, with the fact that I was second last week and it was so close and I threw OB on 17 and kind of lost the tournament on that hole. And also that there have been so many times that I'm in the backyard putting, uh, and I imagine like, all right, Nicholas, this for the win in a big tournament. And I was just thinking like, if I make this putt, I would be so happy after all those second places and all those close calls and mistakes in the in the like right moment. So I felt like so relieved, I would say. Did your phone blow up after you won? Because I don't, it, I mean, what time was it over in, in Finland? It had to have been super early, right? Were people yeah. watching you? It was like 3 a.m. But all my family, all my friends, they were up watching and yeah, oh, it that's was cool. It was absolutely crazy. Yeah. Wow, that's nuts. That is that is very 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 cool. Um. All right, we got a couple. Uh, a well, couple. Got, oh yeah, go ahead, Yuli. Yeah, 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 go for it. What about like so? Finland's obviously this country that just loves disc golf. It's so popular over there, and and obviously being the best player right now over there, you and Vino. Mm -hmm. Who are your like heroes? You know what I mean? To, to where now yeah. you can look at yourself and, and you can be like, oh my gosh, all these guys before me came and tried to win on the tour and they couldn't do that. And, you know, I'm the lucky one that got to go out there and, and, and get this yeah. done for, for anybody. Like who, who are the guys that you looked up to and you were like, man, I'm never going to be that good. Or I hope I can be that guy someday. Mm -hmm. Like who are the guys that really inspired you from Finland? There's many guys. Um, I I think I would say Seppo is the biggest one for me. Uh, he was very good when I was starting this golf in like 2015 or 2016. Uh, also, Pasi Koivu, uh, Jussi Meresma, and uh, even Vaino. Vaino was very good as well when I started, and he still is. And it was it was funny because Seppo kind of took Vaino to US for the first time and kind of made Vaino feel, feel good in US and stuff. And then Vaina took me to here uh, in 2022, and now I want the tournament for Finland. So it feels like I made Finland proud, maybe. <laughs> Not maybe. Yes, you did. How <laughs> how has that been? You know, transitioning from playing, you know, e even in Europe, playing around Europe to now 
you know, you're not, I don't know how long you're planning on being over here before you go back. Like how, how is the travel? How is, how is being away from home for that long? Yeah. I usually do like anything between like eight to 12 weeks. Uh, it's a long time to be away from home and family and stuff. Um, I'm doing like more flying back and forth this year, so I will do three trips and uh, I will actually have more, more tournaments in the US than last year, but I will fly more and uh, I feel like playing in Europe has been like different for me always and now I finally feel like the disco is feeling same for me in the US right now, so mm. it makes me like play a lot better, obviously, uh, I need to think as much and I feel more like at home in the US right now. What, what were some of the differences? Like what were some of the things that made that stood out to you of like, hey, this is different than what it feels like playing in Europe? Uh, I think everything. Uh, I'm so far away from home. It's like 15 hours uh, of traveling to get back home. Uh, language is different. You, don't, you guys don't even understand me all the time because of my English <laughs> and stuff. Um, You're doing a great job, by the way. There was a couple comments on here too saying it's very impressive that you know, your second language, jumping on a podcast and talking with <laughs> us. So you're doing a yeah, fantastic th job. Thank you. Yeah, it's almost everything. Food is different. Um, almost everything. But I finally feel like uh, I'm almost like playing in Finland, if that makes sense. And it makes me like just focus on disc golf and don't think about anything else than playing the tournament. We do have what Cinnabon about... here, though, Nicholas. We do have <laughs> yeah, Cinnabon. Do. And Chipotle. <laughs> yeah, <Yes>. Chipotle. Yeah. <laughs> Favorite ones. <laughs> um, I, I like about... the American Ford. It's good. <laughs> what, about, what about this? I really wanted to ask you this question. So coming into like this tournament, you obviously lost the weekend before, and you've had some second places. USCGC comes to mind. Um but you're also playing against the best players in the world. That's one thing that the U S does have is the pro tour. Right. And so mm -hmm. everybody, anybody can win any, any single weekend. And you have these monsters like Ricky and Gannon and Macbeth and Kyle Klein and all these guys. Um, did you, in your mind, are you thinking like, no, I'm a monster. I'm like these guys. Like, this is where I belong. This is who I am. And like, what is that like playing against them and being like, for example, like you're kind of short in stature and you're a little bit mm -hmm. unassuming and the um, Finland culture is very quiet and you guys are so humble in your approach to the game, which is nice. Cause then when you win, you know, that mm -hmm. electric uh, um, celebration was awesome for all of us because we see the calm, cool Nicholas mm -hmm. and then you win and then the emotion comes out. So I, I feel like a, in America, like we're all kind of like a little bit cocky, you know what I mean? All the time, all the time. Like we wear our confidence on our sleeves mm -hmm. and it's hard to tell with you guys, like inside is Nicholas like, no, I'm a beast. Like these guys can't hang with me or, or do you have a lot more respect for their games and stuff? And you just kind of go through a process a different way. Um, I feel like when I started playing in like 2015, uh, I was watching like all the YouTube and stuff, and I was watching you, uh, Paul, Ricky, all those guys, and they were like so good, so good, and I was like trying to copy Paul's path or Paul's backhand or anything, and they are like my my idols and my heroes, and. Now that I'm here, uh, I feel like in 2022, I knew that I can do good here, but maybe not win yet. Uh, and then last year, I felt like I'm coming closer. Uh, and I know that I can win if I do a good tournament and a good weekend. But now I feel more like um, if I play just OK, I will be in top 10 or top 15. I don't need to like do anything, anything crazy to like be in contention for the win. and that's important for me because if you get those chances often you're also going to win win some of those and uh that's how i look at the game at the moment yeah, yeah i thought it was cool one of the coolest posts i saw was actually from ricky waisaki who mm -hmm. had a picture of you kind of looking at him and then the caption was was awesome it was uh 
welcome to the winner's circle. We've been waiting <laughs> on you. How did that, how did that feel? I thought that was absolutely awesome. Yeah, that was awesome. Actually, I played my first tournament uh, in the US. That was Texas State in 2022. And I was playing with Rigi then. And he said to me that, just continue doing what you're doing. You are very good and you will win here in the US. He said, said that to me in 2022. And I'm very okay. thankful to him. He's like one of the best in the sport to ever play. And he's pushing me forward with that. That's awesome. That's love so it. cool. Yeah, I love I love that uh you know, the pro tour is still so young, yeah. but we get to we're going to experience more and more of these like cool memories, cool stories of players passing the torch like one day you're going to probably do the same thing, right? Yeah. You're yeah. going to see a new up and comer coming on tour and say something the same. So it's so cool that we are we're in this spot right now of where I mean, we've been talking about it on this show where, you know, heck, 30, 40 people can win any given tournament now. Yeah. And then also like you, you, you know, bogey one hole, you're not dropping from third to fourth. You could drop from third to outside the top 10 sometimes. Like yeah. it's, there's so many good players now. It's, it's very, very exciting times uh, for disc golf. Yes. All right. A couple, a uh, couple listener questions here. They wanted to know, first one is, uh, how did you acquire your unique, your unique throwing form? All right. So as I said, I was trying to do like Paul McBeth was throwing, um, when I started playing and in my mind, I felt like I looked just like Paul and then I was, <laughs> then I was recording my, my throw and it was like so different. Um, so Paul has been like a big part. Uh, of my throwing style, even though they don't look the same, but I feel like we can control the disc the same way. We throw like, we are not throwing like 95% on every shot. We like tempo down on some of the shots and control those fairway drivers pretty good. So Paul has been a big role model for me. And also Simon, Simon was also like throwing Europe that time and he was throwing super far. And those two guys are like, my main guys when like starting to learn techniques. Well, that leads me into my next question. This is coming from Kevin. He wants to know what is your max distance? Really curious how much you can get with that smooth form. I think I can do like 500, like on a golf line. That's like almost my max. And there's been so many people telling me that you need to throw farther if you go to the U S and stuff. And I always told, told them that if I place them on the fairway and make my putts, you don't need to throw like 560 to win those tournaments. Mm -hmm. If you just stay in bounds and do you, I think that's all you need to do. Germ had a great call about your form. He says uh, that you're rocking the disc to sleep because it's so smooth. <laughs> I love I love that. Oh, you know, that's a good line. It looks like he's rocking, it, rocking the baby. Mm -hmm. yeah. He says that he's rocking the disc to sleep. Oh, my God. I thought, yeah. that, was, I thought that was amazing. <laughs> Very good line. All right, one of uh, fans' favorite segments here. We get to dig in a little bit and and really kind of see what gets under your skin. So, All right. what are your biggest pet peeves? I need to charge my phone. I have a three percent. I'm back. Oh, well, there bad. you go. All good. All right. That's a well, huge pet peeve. Is when the Sorry. phone goes yeah. dead. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, so the question is, uh, like, what are things either when you're playing in tournaments or casual mm -hmm. rounds or anything? What are some of your biggest pet peeves? Things that like you just can't stand. Mm -hmm. You don't know why they mm -hmm. happen. Yeah, I think number one might be the like moving slowly, like walking slowly. We spoke about that in the beginning. Okay. Uh, that's annoying. Um, then if you don't let uh, like a faster group play play through you, or like if there's like four people playing and there's one guy coming from behind, um, it's annoying if you don't like play behind behind those. Then what was the third one? I know I have something that's super annoying. <laughs> uh, I just know if I ever get a chance where we're playing, I'm just going to moonwalk to my, all my discs to really annoy yeah. you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Slowly just walking backwards to my disc. 
I, I saw your latest episode and somebody said pump fakes and that's also annoying, but I do it myself. So I don't know if I can say that or no. <laughs> that, yeah, that's also annoying. I would say pump fakes. I'm sorry, guys. No, I think, I think pump fakes are fine. It's, it's just when like we were talking about, and, and again, your putt on hole 14, mm-hmm. that, that is a different situation than the second hole of a tournament from 15 feet, right? Like yeah. those two things are very, yeah. very different. And they should, they should be, uh, they should also be, I think, um, handled differently. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't think we should be trying to rush the very end of a tournament. Like yeah. that's when the drama builds. That's when you can yeah. build that story. Um, but that's... if we're on the second hole, brother, and you got a 10 footer and you're like, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, this round's going to be a nightmare. We're, we're in <laughs> yeah. for one here. Yeah. Um, all right, Yuli, he kind of <laughs> answered his question a little bit with the throwing, but there might be another answer here. So yeah, go ahead. Out of everybody on tour right now, who do you look at? And it could be any part of the game and you're like, oh man, that's nice. Like, I'm a little jealous of that guy. Like, who do you look at on tour mm-hmm. and you're like, any, it can be it, anything. It has to be a B. Uh, <laughs> it's always a B. It's like, yeah. It's always a B. I know it's a boring answer, but he's just, when he's throwing far, it's just like, I don't know what's happening. It's like, <laughs> I can do, I can do like half of that, what he's doing. So yeah, if I had that, I would be so good. <laughs> he also does it in such a way where it doesn't look like the way he looks when he throws in distance contests is vastly different than the way he throws in tournaments. Yeah. But he still throws so much farther than everyone in tournaments. So it's like yes. he's got that extra gear that you know, and you're still watching him just like probably throw 90%. And you're just like, geez, Louise, it just yeah. comes out of that pocket so quick. Well, and it's yeah. crazy because his down tempo is so good now. Like he's yes. throwing those Novas and he's just going like walking up three step poof and it's going 350. And you're like, how can somebody who has that much touch mm-hmm. then on the next hole? throw it 512 feet on a spike heiser with a nuke os yeah like, because... it, it's not fair yeah because i know so many guys that throw like as far as ab does at least like almost but they like they have no touch they can throw like slow and uh i also feel like ab is like using the distance he has to his advantage on the course mm-hmm. uh, and that's like that's a very good one all right, I want to leave you before you go here. I want to leave you with a couple stats. This is coming from Edwin Stats here, our statistician. Um, you may or may not know these, but you are actually the fourth European to win an MPO Elite event. You are the third player since 2019 to ace and win in the same event. Uh, the other two being Conrad, James Conrad, Worlds 2021, yeah. and Paul Macbeth, uh, MVP Open 2020. So that's a nice little group that you're a part nice. of. And then you, uh, your 66% birdie rate, that is the highest birdie rate of 2024. Only two players had a higher birdie rate at an elite event in all of 2023. Uh, that's Ricky Wysocki, who birdied 68% of the, the holes at Preserve. And Cole Dolan, who birdied sixty-seven percent of the holes at Waco. So you oh. uh, you birdied a lot of holes this past week, and apparently that's what you need to do to win out here. So keep yeah. doing that. <laughs> yeah, and then you're gonna also double bogey hole six when you do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna hold yeah. that. I'm gonna hold that to you. I'm, I'm never gonna let you forget hole number six. When you yes. pulled out that driver, I was like, "What is he doing right now?" Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> But hey, sometimes you got to be aggressive to win it, and you clearly did. So, uh, really appreciate you taking the time out of of your day, out of your night, to join us on Tour Life. I know all of our listeners really appreciate it, and uh, we wish you the best going forward. Enjoy your week off if you aren't playing anything this week, and uh, we'll see you at Texas States, brother. All right, thank you guys here in Houston. Safe travels. There you have it, the 2024 Open at Austin champion Nicholas Intella. Congratulations, He's just a peach, man. He, Dude, he just... was fun to have on. Isn't he cool? I've had, I've had a couple conversations with him, but nothing like super, super in depth. Uh, he's he's great to talk to. Great. We'll have to have him back on. It was yes. awesome. All right, let's jump into it. So we're going to pull up Edwin's stats now, go through our 2024 MPO Open at Austin event recap. So 
This was at Harvey Pinnock. This this tournament used to be at the Belton, and then it got switched down here, um, which is now in Austin, Texas. We were playing for a total purse of $76,380. This was the 10th lowest um, lowest scoring average uh, score to par uh, with negative uh, seven. Seven under is where it was at. Was it the average score to par? Um, let's see what else we got. So this is an interesting one. I didn't realize this, Yuli. So looking at the course from 2023, which was mostly out in the open, okay, to 2024, where they put us more into the woods, people hit the fairways almost 10, over 10% more fairways were hit on average. And also 7% more circle one and green greens and regulation were hit. OB oh, wow. rate was roughly about the same 18% to 19%. And then the birdie went rate went up from 30% to 35%. So some people may think like, Hey, get us out of stop having us play in these golf courses, get us into the woods. The course actually played easier yeah. uh, on average. Um, it looks like it was an average score of four strokes better um, since I felt 2023. Like it did play easier, but the, it, that's because the par fours are 550 feet. I mean, they were, sh uh, you know, 560. If you stayed in feet, bounds, right? Yeah, if they're you, tiny. That, they're tiny holes. That was the big thing is if you could stay in bounds, you were going to score pretty well out there. Uh, okay, what else we got in here? Let's see. Number of players, the birdie hole 17 and 18 in the same round, only 14 to do it. And Nicholas ended up doing it to. Beat Calvin, uh, Calvin Heimberg by two, I believe, and Kyle Klein by one. Let's see. Kyle Klein, AB, Gannon continue their top 10 dominance. Calvin Heimberg finally shows up. We've got Kyle Klein finish second, almost becoming the first MPO player to ever win from the third card. That was, that was interesting because they were so much farther ahead than lead that it was a very interesting dynamic of how it all worked out of where he was just smoking. Like he was just yeah. crushing. Um, it was cool to see third consecutive top, uh, top 10 for Kyle Klein. So he's, he's been sneaky having a really freaking solid year and we've talked about it. He might be the most like underrated player on tour. Yeah, he's gotta be. I mean, when you think about, when you think about the best players in the world right now, he's not somebody that, you, you know, you put your top 10 together and you might leave them out and then remember and be, and you have to knock somebody else out of there. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? He's like very unassuming. A lot of that stuff has to do with personality as well. Mm -hmm. Like, um, he's, he's very quiet. quiet. Kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's quite kid. His interviews are, he does well, um, in interviews, but it's like a little unassuming. Um, I don't think he's big on social media. Like I don't see posts popping up on my feed yeah. or anything of him doing stuff. So he kind of maybe stays to himself, but his game speaks for it, his himself. Oh, yeah. Man. He doesn't have to say anything. I mean, when you think about the complete package, that's what's crazy about his game. Like his sidearm is so good. It's far. It's accurate. His shot shaping is, is, some of the best in the world. His Heiser flip game's insane. His tight lines are nuts. He throws at 550, and he he makes a lot of putts. Like his putting style also isn't one that you look at and you're like, "Ooh, that's beautiful." Mm -hmm. But when you make it every single time, and he's making a lot of long ones too. If you watch the coverage, like he's dropping at least one in from 80 feet. It seems like every single round, which is crazy. His putting yes. is unconscious right now. Uh, we also have AB, AB finishing with another great, great tournament. He finished tied for fourth, third consecutive top five, third best OB rate of the event too, 7.8%. This just shows you it's not, AB is not good because he throws far. AB is good because he throws far and is accurate. Like he is landing in a lot of fairways. He's keeping the disc in play. That is why he's so good. Gannon Burr, another great finish after coming off of a great performance at Waco, finished tied for fourth, third consecutive top five. Uh, and we mentioned it earlier. He shot the course record of 14 under, which I think Kyle might have been able to break that if they were able to play all 18 yes. holes. 
Because he yeah. shot, I believe, 12 under. And the three holes that we pulled out were all birdieable. Like, were the holes that you want to birdie. So, yes. He definitely could have tied it. Uh, maybe, maybe broken if he would have gotten all three of those. And Calvin Heinberg, you mentioned too earlier in the show of how you kind of tweaked your glute and you weren't able to throw that sidearm and how important that sidearm was. Well, well, Calvin didn't throw a single sidearm yes. all tournament and he finished third and had a putt to tie for second. And at the time, tie for the lead. Which, which of you guys That's haven't wacky. seen his last shot on 18 to get in position to make the putt? Mind blowing. Like shot of the tournament. I don't think they did it on live, at least. I don't know about Jomez, but on live, they did not do a good job. They got to get these cameras behind the player just for a split second so we can see the line they're trying to take. Whenever it's like offset, we can't really see that gap. And so for this, the viewers at home, we played that whole Yuli. There is nothing, nothing on that right side. No, nothing. There, really there, there are a bunch of like little three foot gaps. And I mean, that was the shot of the tournament. And granted, it, you know, maybe you can look at Nicholas's ace. That might, that probably is, <laughs> we probably should give that the shot. No, you, of the tournament. The whole, you can, you can put the whole tournament where Calvin was and nobody's getting in the circle or close to it. Or Crazy. I guess he was just outside the circle, but nobody is. He also putted really well, 27 of 27, only player to uh, be perfect inside the circle all tournament. So all those people that are, you know, we had a bunch of comments, bunch of questions. When should we be worrying about Calvin? What's wrong with Calvin? Clearly he's going to be fine, guys. Yep. He's going to be fine. He doesn't have a sidearm. He's only throwing backhands and he's still able to play a course that really benefit having a good sidearm. He did just fine. Um, other thing I want to mention the wins in round one, I think, I think scores would have been even better had we not gotten that crazy wind whole, whole 10 and 11 were just absolute nightmares to try to land in bounds on whole one or day one. Like the wind was, the, the wind was ripping so hard left to right. I threw Yuli. It was weird. I threw like an overstable zone at the basket being like, this thing's going to fly dead straight. Like I'm just trying to like laser this thing and it somehow worked itself back. It was like mind boggling. You would see one person throw and their disc would just get shot down. You'd see another person throw and it would get lifted up a hundred feet. The fact that some of these guys shot as well as they did in the first round is, is uh, I don't, I don't quite understand how it happened. Um, how did you think the course held up as far as like the water and stuff goes? It rained a whole lot. It, it held up pretty good. Actually. The only thing that was awful is listen, they got to figure out these tee pads. Those tee pads were awful. All right, they, let's started jump. Dro- they started drooping in the middle of the tee pads. Yeah. Like let's jump holes. to that photo. Silas, if you can throw that photo up real quick. I don't know if you saw all these posts, Yuli, we've got a photo from, uh, I believe it was James Conrad. We've got one of Simon Lazat, and then we have one from Adam, who are all basically just saying how bad the tee pads were. I was on that card with Conrad. Like he what happened biffed. there? He just slipped and just absolutely <laughs> launched. A bunch of mud? Did he, he was covered in mud? Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah, I felt so bad. He was so mad too. And walking down the fairway, I did the worst <laughs> thing you could ever do. Cause he obviously biffs it and he's going, he's going, he's trying to get Eagle on that hole, right? That's hole 11. Okay. And we're walking up the fairway and I'm like, yeah, I think you went out right by that sign right there. And he looked at me cause he was in this horrible place. And he looked at me, he's like, like all surprised. And I'm like, I'm just kidding. Here. <laughs> the fairway, Cause there's no way he would have watched his shot. You know what I mean? Oh, and, yes. Uh, he hit me with his umbrella. He's like, you son of a, he like hit me with his umbrella. It was a pretty funny thing. Uh, it was uh, crazy. Those tee pads all throughout practice. I thought they were fine. I, I was a little nervous on a couple of them being a little grippy where my leg, my like foot kind of caught. Yeah. And for anyone that has knee injuries, that that's like the last thing you want to have happen is your, yeah. your, your knee go this way, but your foot staying behind or, or your body going this way, but your knee staying behind. But yeah, once that water, once those storms came in, Yuli, those things are not good when the storm, they, no. they got all lumpy um, towards, I, I like the frame idea, right? The wooden frame idea, but 
really, really bad when the front of the tee pad goes down and then yeah. up. Like yeah. they were basically like a dip. So some scary stuff. We're going to always talk about tee pads because as players, the only time we ever want to feel comfortable is on the tee. That's yeah. it. Any, any other time? Sure. Whatever. But on the tee, I feel like that should be like the safe area. We shouldn't be worrying about hurting ourselves. And then the other thing is that I, that I do get frustrated with, especially on the tour right now, is when we go into a place and they're cutting out new, new holes a week before the tournament, two mm. weeks before the tournament, and they're cleaning up these places because the roots that are left on the ground, like, Scary. and like you'll stub your toe, you'll, you know, the mulch was great because I was thinking about this and I was complaining about it. I'm like, this mulch is horrible because there's big old sticks like this big and you've, you've toss it out of the way with your foot and then three more sticks come up somehow. And you're like, what the heck? And you toss more. And then you're just like, okay, this, this is impossible. But then I was thinking like, if we didn't have the mulch and those sticks everywhere, it would have been, the would have been, it would have been, been wild. It, it wouldn't have been playable. So, no. So it was good that we had it, but at the same time, what do you want me to give you some good news? Yes. They're laying down sod. That's the That's goal. That's what I heard. That's yeah. what I heard. They're going to try to make all happens, those fairways grass, which is going to be incredible. When that happens, it'll be the best course on tour. It will be absolutely as, as far incredible. As like aesthetically, it'll be the best. It'll be the best course on tour visually. I, th I think because it's already good. You have the open holes, which are whatever, even the par five, I felt like filmed really well on, on camera mm -hmm. as far as being able to see what was actually happening in the distance and, and, and everything, especially with the tall grass on the sides and the white stakes. I thought it looked really nice and it didn't really look like a, like a, what the you call it as the traditional golf course nine. Mm -hmm. I think they could do a better job of nine of clearing right away a spot to where then you could see the fairway kind of go. So it's not just high grass and we're not really seeing, yeah. you know what I mean? Like the part the five though, the, the tough thing there is like, we're throwing our second shots like over the green. Like this is where if disc golf had millions of dollars, that green would be a lake. Yes. And now that hole, all of a sudden it's like, this is one of the coolest holes on tour. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. But, but if I'm being honest, I, I think that once they put the saw down and if, if it works, it'll be one of the best places we play. I still think it's soft. I think the course was really soft. And I think once you put it, saw needs down, wind. it'll, it'll be even softer. So I, I hope they don't like, like 18, they took the OB away on the left hand. I don't know why you would do that. Like leave the OB. Like just leave, leave all the OB. <laughs> I don't know why they're taking OB and put, put, they push the OB farther back on 18. And now if you kick farther in on 18, you get double penalized. It's well, not even single, single well, penalized. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about OB in the woods. What are your thoughts on, cause I, I you know, there's pushback. Some people think there shouldn't be any OB in the woods and yeah. we should, we should be able to scramble and that's what they want. It's tough. I think, I think as a course designer, like for example, hole, hole seven, hole seven has a tree right in the middle of the fairway. Mm -hmm. I love that tree because it's far enough and close enough at the same time for you to be able to shape something the way a disc can it. actually fly. So it gives you an obstacle right there. I don't think it's very cool looking to me. Mm, I don't think it looks not. good, but the way they're trying to make you shape a shot makes that hole actually pretty difficult to mm -hmm. where if you got rid of it, it would just be a gimme, but mm -hmm. they placed it at a spot to where it's almost a perfect distance for you to be able to shape from left to right to right to left and vice versa, different ways, whether you're left-handed, you're throwing sidearm back in it or, or whatever. When you get to holes like six, there are trees that don't make a lot of sense on where they place them to where at the end of your flight, you could kick those and go out of bounds where somebody could kick the same tree and stay in bounds. I don't like that. Yes. So if you're going to have OB up there, that's random. That's random luck where you get double penalized for a good shot, right? Hole 14 is another really good example. 
with the OB down the left hand side. 17. Great hole. You kick the trees on the left and you go out of bounds left, you Every deserve time. it. Yes. That's a bad shot, right? And it gives you enough shot shape uh distance to be able to control something to go into a green. Now, when you place out of bounds, like I said, on hole six, pretty tight. Some good shots go OB. Some bad shots don't. I don't like that. So if they're going to keep making, I don't mind OB in woods. If there's no bad trees to kick and there's no roots to hit to, to shoot you out of bounds. Um, but what happens is it makes the course play short when you take those trees out. Cause now people can blast as far as you can go out of bounds or be safe and then have a short little upshot. So then you have to make longer holes with no truck with none of those, I call them bogey trees in the middle of the fairway. So and it's it a tough thing. It's up to the course designer to really figure out what the correct distance is. Cause you can do it. Mm -hmm. If you place a tree, like on hole seven on hole six, it's still a fair shot shape. Just take the other ones out and have OB everywhere. That's fine to me because if you hit one of those trees, you deserve it. And this is what I'll say with, in regards to OB in the woods, I think it is needed a lot of yes. the time because I don't think there is any skill in chucking a forehand roller as far as you can in the woods. I just don't think that's skillful. Like maybe sure there is skill in throwing it through a gap, and for then it to hit and turn into a roller, but you have no idea where that disc is going to go. You yep. don't know what tree it's going to hit. You don't know what's happening. All you're trying to do is advance it as far as possible. You know what? I didn't really see that often in the woods this I week. Rollers. I didn't see rollers. Why? Because there's OB and that's scary. Like hole 18. I bet if there wasn't OB, I think a lot of people throw maybe even Calvin, if he, can, he couldn't throw a sidearm, but maybe a, a roller becomes a play there because it's way easier to hit a, this, a gap this big when your disc is vertical than when your disc is horizontal. And to me, it's just like, I don't think that's really skillful. I don't like that style of disc golf of just chucking and praying. And um, the only way to take that away is to add that risk of like, wait a second, like my disc could go OB. And I think Niklas did a perfect example of explaining the difficulty of hole six. I'm with you. I don't know if you need that OB right away on that hole to where you can get screwed, but having that OB for his second shot, like he, he made a risky play by going for it and he could have played it a much different way. Yes. I, I like that. I like seeing having to play. What should I do here versus yeah. like, this is the only play. I, I also think that 17 and 18 were perfect finishing holes because it made you do the exact opposite shot back to back T shots. Yes. Yes. Like you have to have the skill of pulling the disc from left to right off of a tree and getting it to flex out. And then the next mm -hmm. one, you have to throw a subtle hyzer flip complete opposite shots. I really like the, um, the idea behind that. Yes. Um, all right, let's see here. Uh, what is this? This is, I don't know. What is that? Oh, I think he just added on. All right. I think, I think that's the, uh, I think that's the end of the Edwin stats. I know, All right. Later. <laughs> I know we, I know we jumped around a little bit, but shout out to Edwin stats. I think that is going to do it for that segment. And, oh, I do want to mention one thing. I made a tweet that said best part of my tournament was not showing up late to my tea times. Uh, I think people, you know, everyone's going to view. If you like me, you're going to view that as that's a funny joke. Brody played terrible. He's making a joke of he played so bad that the best thing he did was show up on time. Right. And if you don't like me, you're going to look through it as a lens of me basically like poking fun at people showing up late. However you want to do it. Holly Finley ended up showing up late. She made a comment saying that in 12 years, in 278 events, this was the first time she's ever showed up late to a tee time. That's, cr that's, that's a crazy stat. But my question to you, Yuli, is we've seen it now at every single tournament. Do you like that there is a two-stroke penalty or do you think we should do a fine? 
or like maybe uh, a percentage a percentage out of I mean, your, it is ca- a fine. your cash. If you, it is a fine. It is you're, a fine in a way, <laughs> I guess. For yeah. Sure. Um, I I don't think it. I listen. You show up late to your tea time at this point. Like something had to have happened. You lose track of time. You should get a two stroke penalty. Like at this point, there's been enough people who've gotten stroked. Everyone's talking about everybody's it. Everybody's talking about it. Every time I show up to the starter tent, I go, Hey, I'm here. Like, and I'm 10 minutes early just to make a joke. Like it's getting old, right? They might um, need to start stroking people for showing up too early. Maybe because I'm it's starting to get kind of, before. it's starting to get kind yeah. of crowded up there. Yuli. Yeah, you're like, you is. have people that are teeing off two two groups behind you already showing I'm, up. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the same boat. I don't think we should have a freaking five minute tea time. <laughs> I don't. I really don't. I think it's silly. Um, oh, man. I don't think that we should have. <laughs> like, I got to be careful because I almost slipped a, a naughty in there, but no, it just so, makes hey, me, it you're makes me it so be real. Yeah, Raw. it makes me so frustrated that they think we need to, again, it was the, the we announcer. We do, though, was Yuli. Awesome. No, we no, do listen, need the it because there's was three awesome. people now every tournament that haven't showed up on time. We don't need it. That's five minutes. They don't need to be there. But anyways, <laughs> they don't need to be there five minutes. The guy, again, told me about the... Oh, I knew me, you were going to love that. He told the me fly about... Mart. The fly I knew you were going to love the that. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, <laughs> dude, I'm about to tee off... For my freaking tournament, I don't care about what's happening. But you can bend for free, Yuli. You can bend for free. Yeah. <laughs> I also probably got an email saying that I could do that, and I don't oh. need I don't need these announcements, and I don't I don't. You know what they need to start doing? I'm gonna be honest. If you're showing up that early, make it productive. Get a couple interviews from the people or something. You Ooh, know what I, don't I mean? Hate that. Like have a guy sitting that. there and be like, "Are you ready for your vote?" Throw some extra in for the live or or whatever, but don't just make me. I'm sitting there for four minutes doing nothing, watching the card in front of me tee off. Electric we, stuff. We're not doing anything. Four minutes. Four you minutes do, is you a do long need time. That five seconds to put the code in for your PDJ live score. My uh, my codes are <laughs> always in there. Like, and I, you're pre coded. You're right. You're showing uh, up pre-coded. It's just so frustrating. But anyways, do I think people should get stroked? Yes, it's a rule. Stroke everybody who doesn't show up on time. Do I need to be there? ten? I'm there 10 minutes before so I don't get <laughs> stroked. If I show up exactly five minutes, that's pretty risky business. I'm not going to yeah. do that. So now I'm, I'm, I'm showing in that up. Seven to, yeah, I'm that seven to eight range. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be there five minutes before my five minutes because that the strokes are important. <laughs> yes. And it's silly. Why am I there 10 minutes before my tea time? This is, it's a silly thing. But anyways. Uh, Frank, one of our Tour Life crew members, shout out to all our Tour Life crew members. We really appreciate the sport. He just in the chat said, Yuli, jump up and talk into the live cam they had going. Uh, So I guess you could technically have your own interview. We did. We did. Silas and I jumped up there and we... uh... Silas was telling him to go get some merch and stuff. It's so weird. Yeah, we you can just have your it. own interview, I guess, on there. Maybe you maybe gotta we'll... be careful what you're saying there too. Yeah, it's a hot if mic. If you're having a personal conversation on the T, you're you're live right there, bro. Be like, yeah, I'm staying at blah blah. My room is 138. <laughs> um, yeah, they just come on. They don't want you talking about the code too, because then people are gonna get in the code <laughs> yeah. for the live. They're like, no, you got to look at this. I can't say it out loud. Oh. I'm like, this is a mess, guys. What are we doing? Oh man. Um. All right. Let's see here. What do I want to jump to? Let's go to FPO. I think we're ready to talk to about some FPO here. All right. So intern David roasted me a little bit with this tweet. He said when Brody didn't include own as a top threat to Kristen threw up the Michael Jordan. I took that personally. Uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to first say it. Own, own me. Own, own me. <laughs> All right. Uh, Yuli to give you credit. I was listing off the players that could potentially beat Kristen. I left own out of that conversation and you quickly jumped in. You're like, don't forget about own. And I was like, oh my gosh. I stand corrected. Own showed this week just why her name should be at the tip of all of our tongues when we're talking about the best 
women disc golfers in the world. She didn't just go out and beat Kristen Zatar. She went out and laid a smackdown on everyone. An you absolute smackdown. This is the proof that putting is the great equalizer. It is in, in our sport. If you go out in any division and you just make everything and you just keep it in bounds, like you're going to have a chance to win. And I don't think this is going to be the last time we'll own wins this year. Like I really don't. Like, I do. Si- yeah, go ahead. I, I, we watch Kristen. You know what she does? She throws consistent shots right down the fairway both mm-hmm. ways, and she makes a lot of putts. She's not it's doing what, anything special. That's what Owen did, but she just did it a lot better this week. Yeah. Now, I do stand by what I said of where I do think some of these courses, I, I don't know she has the disc, because yes, putting for sure is the great equalizer, but if you're only able to throw to the back, like throw inside a circle two on 12 holes, and you're playing against people that can throw inside a circle two on 18 holes, you're at a massive disadvantage. We talked about it. This course had a lot of short par fours. This, this was not a long course by any means. This was a short course. A lot of sidearm flex shots too. A lot of sidearm flex shots in the woods that she was throwing beautifully. So I'm curious to see, and I don't know the FPO layouts that well, like off the top of my head, I, I do a decent, like I do a decent job going into the tournament knowing, but right now I don't know what are the long courses on tour for FPO. If she can get it done at one of those courses, then I think that narrative drops and she can win at every event. But right now I'm still under the thing of where I, I put her at one B right below Kristen at a lot of these short courses. Yeah. I don't know. I <laughs> she won by a lot, bro. I know, man. That that second it, round was thing, wild. That second round was yeah. insane. The thing is, is she at least Kristen got second. If Kristen would have got third, we would be talking about, oh, she didn't have this. And I heard some stories about her having uh, some injuries sort of injuries or something. Injury, yeah. like calm down. If she was playing a hundred percent, own wins the tournament. Yeah, it, it's tough to look at that and say that uh, Owen was going to get beat. You won by a billion? You won no. by 11, I believe? <laughs> yeah, she's, she is that wins. What, is, is that what the final... I think it that was. I think it was being? 11. Let me see here. Uh, she ends up winning by 11. She shot 10 under the final round. Kristen played well the final round, shooting 8 under. Um, yep. Round 2, she shot the... Insane round, 13 under with a bogey. Kristen ended up struggling a lot in round two. Kristen actually tripled the whole eight, uh, 18 to end up shooting two under. And then round one, Own uh, actually didn't get off that well. Own only shot three under round one. So yeah. um, it just looked like, you know, Own had two incredible rounds. Kristen had one good round in like two eh, rounds. What I'm going to say, though, is if we've seen this in sports, if Own just figured it out, how to keep her disc in bound, like she just did it this weekend, right? She Mm -hmm. has the winning formula. And she doesn't play that good. She might be able to keep up with Kristen. You know what I mean? If she just found that that little avenue of being like, okay, I'm going to throw these consistent shots. I'm going to make some putts, blah, 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 blah. I don't know, man. I don't think the distance is really that big a deal. Because we're gonna, we're gonna find out next week because Edwin's pulling the stats. He's saying it right now. He's gonna go yeah. back and pull the stats. I can't wait. Me too. Me too. I'm excited to see. At least there's somebody challenging her. And not only challenging her, at least we Chris didn't win every tournament. I think I said last week for sure she wasn't gonna win every tournament. And now we, we can stop with that because at a point I was yeah. thinking Chris <laughs> might win every tournament. I thought this so year. too. I thought so too. Uh, and Edwin also let us know too, that uh, Harvey Pinnock is the fifth shortest course on tour for the men. Um, so yeah. I think sometimes people just look at the distance and they think like, Oh my God, 11, uh, 11,000 feet. Holy cow. So you got to look at the par. Because if it's yeah. 11,000 feet par 54, yeah, that's a freaking long course. But if it's 11,000 feet par 70, that's not a long course at all. 
That just yeah. means we're playing a bunch of par fours that are 600 feet. So yeah. you got it. You got to look at the par guys. Don't forget about the par. Uh, okay. Let's see. What else do we got? FPO Des Redding. I believe this was her first time doing commentary. Fantastic. We get her in the booth more, please. She, she made great. a, she made a comment about something along the lines of like, if you're taking, if you're taking a shot every time, every time own makes a putt, uh, you might want to start thinking about switching to juice. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> I thought, I thought she did a fantastic job. Did awesome. I did too. knowledgeable, knew when to talk, when to be yep. silent, build the moment. Really, mm-hmm. really liked Des Redding. So hopefully she is back in the booth. Um, Katrina Allen had a slight, we've been talking about her. I mean, she's pregnant, but she had a little bit of a, Oh, maybe she's back. So we're, we'll kind of keep an eye out on that Paige Pierce. What are we thinking here? Did, did she come back too soon? Or do you think if she's not doing anything right now that could potentially put her in more harm, she's just getting the reps back, getting the rust off. Like what, what, what's your mindset on I her? I think she's just getting the reps back. It doesn't seem like she's in a lot of pain. Look like she was playing and I didn't see her like, you know, struggling to get around the course. Listen, she snapped her leg in half. No, I know. Like, it's not like she's just like, you, you do that, do a little rehab and then you're back. You know what My I mean? question gone, though is you've like, you've gone through how many knee surgeries it takes a while to get your confidence back in an athletic in an athletic sport. And now if it, if this lasts, let's say 10 tournaments, we got problems, but I don't think it will. I think the first three tournaments, five, six tournaments, you should be able to gain confidence, learn how to score, do the thing. She's a world champion. I, I don't think we worry about that yet. Yeah, she ends up shooting 76, 66. So she had a decent round two and then 76 as well to finish the tournament at 20 over par, um, finishing in 40th place. So yeah, my only concern here is... As long as she didn't come back too soon and she's yeah. putting herself at risk of not getting back to a hundred percent. But if this is just something like, Hey, I'm, I'm able to play right now with no risk of injury. I'm able to play without uh, messing myself up more then I think I'm fine with these bad results because yeah. she'll slowly work herself back into it. Yep. And, you know, hopefully by the end of the season or in a couple months, like you said, we can see when she's playing well, we can see her back at the top of the leaderboard, um, pushing Kristen and own and everything. Uh, anything else stick out to you from FPO? Nope. Uh, okay. Other thing I wanted to say too, I think in disc golf, there are two elements. There are the element of being in the woods and having hit lines. And then I think the other element is being in the open and having to control the skip, uh, control your angle. And then also it is a skill when you're in the woods and you've got a gap in front of you, 200 feet, you've got a target. I got to throw it through there when you're out in the open and there's no trees that you have to manage. There is a skill involved of like, where am I aiming this? Like how far do I want to swing it? Like I struggled on hole one, the first two days, because my target line was not good. It was too inside. And so I kept skipping and going like 30, 40, 50 feet left. If there was a tree, like two trees that we had to throw through to get to that basket, that's a much easier shot. If I'm struggling with my tar- like my aim point, because it's like, I have to throw through this and then the disc will f- work its way over to the basket. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think sometimes people are like, we need to get in the woods. We, I think there is an element of disc golf that is takes a skill of being able to throw out in the open with OB. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, you have to, you have to visualize what you're doing at what distance. And when there's no trees, it, it's definitely a little bit harder. And that's where the field work comes in. When you're in the field, you better be visualizing like trees in your way and shot shapes and, and everything release point, all those key ingredients and in throwing good shots. Um, one thing that I, I try to do, and I'm obviously not the farthest thrower, but when I'm doing field work, 
I'm throwing as far as I can, but I'm visualizing like trees on both sides and peeling them off of certain spots so that I have just a tight flight. That way, wherever I'm aiming, I'm throwing the same flight pretty much. Like I Mm -hmm. always want to do like a power left to right drifting, barely maybe like a 15 foot drift from right to left on all shots. If you can do that, if you can throw a 450 foot straight shot, you just change Very your disc good. and then yep. it just comes back and skips and bounds. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. All right. Does disc golf have a weather problem? So we've talked about it a little bit. We didn't end up playing three holes. The final round, we skipped hole 12, 15 and 16. We ended up only playing 15 holes. I actually made a tweet about this. I think I found out about it way before it was announced to the public because I think people, <laughs> People were thinking it was, oh, here comes Brody again, trying to change disc golf. Um, I was literally saying like, why do we play 18 holes? Right? Because when they were like, hey, you're only playing 15 holes, it made me think like, for all those people that are telling me, Brody, stop trying to make disc golf more like golf. This is where you should be jumping in on my side. Why are we playing 18 holes? 18 holes is a golf thing. That is what golf decided they were going to do a front nine, a back nine. Why does disc golf have to play 18 holes? And this is a legitimate question. Like, can we play 10 holes? Can we play 12 holes? Can we play 15 holes? And if your argument is, well, there's not enough score separation. I have two things to counter that one. We just played a three hole, a three round tournament. We played 54 holes last week. We played 72 holes. So we played way less holes here And there was still plenty. No one was saying, oh, we need another day. There's not enough score separation. So if we play a four round tournament and we play 12 or, you know, 13 holes a day, that's 52 holes. That's almost the same amount of holes of a three round 18 hole tournament. And then if your argument's like, well, we need, we need more holes that you play in one day with score separation. Nicholas was just on here telling you that hole 12, the whole day removed 12, 15 and 16, the top guys are all birding that hole. So those holes almost don't even exist to begin with. Like those aren't real holes. There aren't really score separation holes. You're not, you're not bogeying that. So what are your thoughts on that? Do you ever see that we could change from 18 holes to 12 holes? And now rounds are taking an hour and a half. I mean, you could, but I mean, it's just the way that the game's played. It's like saying, okay, I love tennis, but let's play tennis on a pickleball court. Like no, just no, not, yes, no, no, yes, no, 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 no. Yes, it'd be more like, hey, instead of like instead of doing these five uh, best of five sets, let's do best of three, which they do end up doing. So I guess it's equivalent to what we're doing, where some tournaments are four rounds versus three rounds. That. Yeah, we still do that. But, but question: Can I have another counterpoint? Mm-hmm. One thing that I think limits a lot of times course design is space. They, don't, they have to put 18 holes in this amount of space, and we don't have a lot of space. What if we could put 10 really freaking good holes? And again, I'm not, I actually don't even know if I like this idea. I'm just throwing out, you know, why are we locked in on 18? I think it's just so connected to golf. Like, when you, when you say golf, it's just 18 is the thing. <laughs> I don't think there's any other reason besides that. So everyone, be. everyone that's coming after me for trying to make disc golf more like golf needs to come after Yuli and say, <laughs> we're not golf, Yuli. We're disc golf. We, we're going to play four holes now. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't, it's an interesting I don't, thought. It's an interesting thought for sure. I mean, I would much rather play 14 holes that are great than 18 with four holes that suck. Yeah. I would rather play. I would rather use the land for that. Um, but I mean, I guess on the pro tour, it really shouldn't matter. I think in smaller tournaments and stuff, when you're doing like shotgun starts, you can have more people in the tournament. That's one reason. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, no. I, yeah, we played I'd 20 much, holes at De La a couple of years ago. Yep. I would much rather have like better holes for sure. The other thought is too, like, th- I mean, I think, the disc golf pro tour does have a weather problem. I think they literally do. I don't think they have a good solution. I think uh, just taking holes out, it worked for this tournament. And luckily the tournament was really exciting, 
I don't think you're necessarily going to get that every single time. So I don't know what they can do differently. You know, Jeff did mention that maybe starting on finishing on Monday, but the big issue here is you're having two tournaments a lot of times on one course, right? We're having the FPO tournament and the MPO tournament. So I've been thinking about this a lot and everybody says, go to Monday. What I've been thinking is when you see the weather being so bad, Saturday, Sunday, Friday, why not start on Thursday? Ooh. Like we're already all there. Like why not start on that day and then play and then we're just done on, on Saturday or we have a buffer day to where maybe we can get the rest of them in. So or these are a lot on of Wednesday. Yeah. You know these are... I mean? Cause we're already there. That's all I'm saying. I, I see what you're saying. I, I would, I would argue some people are going to come back to you, or I would say some people are going to come back to you and say that everyone is going to be there, which is valid. It's, it's getting smaller and smaller, it's more of a, they're probably going to be there compared to Monday. And if we all knew it, like, Hey, this is the rule. If there's weather coming up, they send an email and they're like, okay, possible start on Wednesday. Then we kind of know. You know what I mean? Instead of just having two round tournaments or whatever, yes. I just, I, I feel like that would, that would be easier than us right now as we sit pushing it to Monday. Let me throw out two other ideas as well. First one, let's just start cutting the field. Let's, let's get cuts. Like, there's no reason I, I, I need to play that final well, round. We should just start asking people, are you going to DNF this weekend? You're done. <laughs> <laughs> if you uh, DNF, you're done. Just I was going to say, let, let's play around with cuts. And also, they have now shown precedent that you will be able to play in threesomes. They send out threesomes. When someone DNFs and they're, 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 the foursome is no longer, they have sent out threesomes. The... Um, the second day, I want to say, there was two threesomes in front of us. So my other thing is, let's make more threesomes. Make a cut and make almost every card in front threesomes so you can literally fly through these rounds. So those are the other two things. I don't know. We'll see, we'll, we'll see what ends up happening, but this is an issue. It is a problem. Um, imagine, Yuli, if we're at USDGC and they're like, all right, we're not going to play. Let, let's imagine something crazy happened where you had people already play, already like play some holes, right? To where they're like, all right, we can only cut these last four holes. And they're at USCGC. They're like, all right, for time, we're not going to play 16 and 17 final round. Do you know how crazy that would be if you're not playing 17? I mean, they cut a whole round at USCGC once. Okay. All right. We <laughs> final round. Play. That's not, let's not throw rocks at big germ over here. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, yeah. uh, I don't know. It's something that needs to be solved. I don't know what the solution is. I, I threw out a couple ideas. You threw out some ideas. It'll be interesting to see where the pro tour the key goes. Ingredient is Monday. We play on Mondays. If we don't get the tournament in, you just play it on Monday, which I think is fine for a lot of places. This place would be tough when you have a kid's golf camp taking precedent over the practice rounds. Th that's all <laughs> hogwash because if this is a rule, it's not going to be instated this year. It'll be next year, right? It'll no, be no, instated no. beforehand. Sure. I'm just okay. saying like yes. how much m extra money is it going to cost to tell the golf course, hey, we might need to use Monday as well. Like do they have to put more money down to secure that? For that to potentially maybe. happen. Yeah, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see a legit. Hey, maybe Jeff Spring will come on the show. We've asked him. Maybe, maybe he'll come on the show and, and answer <laughs> some of these tough questions. Um, all right, let's move on. Lori Let Lettinen, one of the better European players, makes a post on Instagram this week announcing that he will not be touring for some time. He said, I experienced the worst mental game challenges I've ever had in Waco. Because of this, I decided to leave the U S for a while to rebuild the pieces together. As much as it hurts to leave the tour, this was really the only option I had. Thank you everybody for the support. Um, kind of a big news. Like he, he's a big European player. He he's been, he's had some really good finishes on tour. So sending him all the best. Um, and hopefully, hopefully he can figure it out and come back on tour better and stronger. Yeah, get your mind right. 
Shout out to Schwebby. Schwebsters. Schwebby takes down his 400th PDGA Pro event. 400. Uh, Schwebby sometimes is in the chat. I know he listens to this podcast. So I do want to get a guest on the podcast before. Guest as well on the podcast. Big shout out to Schwebby uh, for taking that down. Incredible. 400 wins. Wow. Do you think you'll ever get to that number, Yuli? No. (laughs) Absolutely not. Nor will I try. (laughs) I was going to say, you would have to put some major effort just playing like a C tier event every week. I think uh, I think I could get to 200 by the by the end of my career, which is which could be a goal, which would be pretty cool. 200, be very is a nice, lot. especially Not if you could retire with retire with a win on number 200. Oof. Oh, that'd be sweet. That would be very nice. Uh, Kona Star Montgomery announces on Instagram this week as well that she will make her return this week at the U.S. Women's Championship. This is six months after finding out that she had thyroid cancer. So she's kind of been on the fence. I've been paying attention. She's kind of been on the fence on these last couple of events of whether or not she wanted to come back. And she seems like she's taking the required time to feel like she's 100% coming back. And so Love that. we will see her at the first major of the year next week and uh, wishing her all the best. Let's jump into the wild story of the week. This week is from Tanner. Tanner says there's a little pitch and putt course at a local elementary school where I live. I thought it would be a great place to take my seven year old to throw around and play. It, I was going to play. Uh, I was going well, but the first sign of trouble was when I threw a zone and a gust of wind picked up and dropped it on top of the school. Bye bye zone on the next hole. I'm trying to explain to my sweet child that he doesn't need to full send a putt. My kid just starts spinning in circles. As a result, I'm standing about three feet directly behind him and I decide I'll let him do his spins and then we will revisit the putting conversation. As he makes his third spin, the disc launches out of his hand and hits me directly in the eye. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I fall down trying not to yell obscenities and further scare my child who is concerned he has killed his father. (laughs) The disc hit my eye hard enough to knock out my contact. Oh my gosh, been there. I'm very blind. I had to drive us back home with only one functioning eye. Yikes. Thankfully, the damage is pretty minimal and I just had a gnarly black eye. But it's a good reminder that nowhere is safe when a defiant seven year old is holding a putter. <laughs> oh, that's uh, good stuff. We gotta get some uh we gotta get some coverage of of like youth disc golf. That yes. would be electric. Like under ten. Like mm-hmm. you know how they do the masters is coming up and they do that putt put uh yeah. D- putt putt chip dr- drive wow. drive chip putt. Is it drive chip putt? Might be. That's, right. That doesn't sound right either. Chip, chip, chip. <laughs> chip, 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 putt, drive. Oh my gosh. I don't know. What, okay. Whatever it is, they do that. It's always fun to watch before the masters. That would be kind of cool to do like a little event like that before USDGC or something. Uh, another idea for free for you guys out there. Take it how you will. All right. I mean, they Dar- do have a lot of kids going out there to uh, the edge Tons. at USDGC. Yeah. So they have that little um, drive, chip, putt. Area. <laughs> yeah, a lot of kids out there, a lot of kids for the European Open. Uh, really cool to see a lot of kids at these events. Uh, all right, we've got one here from Dark and Stormy. A couple listener questions before we wrap up the show. Dark and Stormy wants to know Is one month too long for the Pro Tour to spend in just one state? Too long? Yeah, he's asking, Is it too long? I don't care where we go as long as they're good courses. I really don't. I mean, as long as I'm not going from Massachusetts to Washington, I'm good. Yeah, I, I've even, I think I had an argument on debate night. Pitch, putt, and drive? That doesn't sound right either. Chip, <laughs> putt, and drive? It's definitely not pitch. Chip is definitely in there. Someone's got to look this up and tell me, please. Um, I had an argument on debate night, I think it was last week, where I was saying, like, listen, if Charlotte is, like, the biggest hub of disc golf, and Charlotte is going to show out because we've seen it in other uh, sporting events, right? Like if, if you're a huge Carolina Panthers fan, just because there's back-to-back home games, that doesn't mean like, Oh, I'm not going to go to this home game. I just went to the last one. There's season ticket holders. There's tons of people. So I've always had the argument. The tour should go to where the best courses are with the biggest fan base. That's just where we should go. 
Yep. Where are the good courses? Where are people going to show up? And if that's like Charlotte, we should have four events in Charlotte. I don't care. Like if there's four really good tournaments and we're going to have thousands of people show up to each week, I'm down with that. Like let's not go to some random place in the middle of nowhere and have 50 people show up. I don't, I don't see how that's a good thing. Agreed. All right. Uh, last question here comes from Demon on Twitter. He said, you teased Tour Life this on the last pod. Any update or info Ooh. on that? Well, <laughs> Demon, we've got good news for you, brother. We, Yuli's got him right here in hand. Look at that. We've got a Tour Life. I believe that's a Jawbreaker Zone. Then I believe we have a Tour Life. Is that the ESP Buzz, I believe? This is the Raptor. And then the Z Raptor, I believe, is the other one. This is the Zoner. Or no, this is the Buzzer. Yeah, the buzz, and, and I that's think that's the jawbreaker zone. zone. Yeah. Um, and as of right now, the stock is going quick. We only have 22 buzzes left, 25 raptors left, and 22 zones left. So if you want to support the show and uh, get out in the course throwing some tour life discs, go over to foundationdisc.com, pick them up. I think I'm going to do a video soon where I only play with those three discs, so that could be fine. Okay, Bobby says drive, chip, and putt. Yeah, that's it. Drive, chip, and putt. Drive, chip, and putt. That's mm-hmm. what we're going with. Okay. This Makes is like sense. one of those. <laughs> this is like one of those things where like you just completely forget something and nothing is clicking. It nothing has clicked yet. Uh, that's all it. right. Tour life crew. Shout out to all our tour life crew members. Your the chat's been amazing. Thank you guys so much. Uh, you, uh, Silas, where are we at on the tour life merch update versus Ooh, give us grip locked? Update. How are we? All working? right. Yeah. So. Tour life, or I, no, let's go Griplock. Griplock is at 220. Okay, they went up a lot and last week. Tour life is at 259. Ooh, baby. Ooh. Okay. Getting close to 300. If you're Love looking that. for some, uh, some sweet tour life merch, if you want some hats, if you want some shirts, if you want some hoodies, head over to foundationdisc.com. Check out all the tour life merch. Always cool to see it on tour, too. Uh, I always notice it's like, it, it's, uh, uh, what am I? I was going to say something. I was going to say another really bad analogy and I just complete, I, I don't know what's going on with my brain. It's over two hours. That's why these podcasts normally go right about two hours. Cause my brain starts shutting off after this. Done. Uh, so maybe it was a good thing that Owen didn't come on. Cause it would have been the last part of this podcast could have been an d- absolute disaster. <laughs> so, uh, we'll definitely have to have Owen on at some point. But uh, shout out to Nicholas. Uh, congratulations again. Congratulations to Own uh, as well. Shout out to Schwebby. Uh, shout out to Yuli. Shout out to Silas. Shout out to Edwin Stats. Uh, Grant, our social clips guy. David, our intern. Everyone that makes this podcast work. And shout out to all you guys listening, our viewers right here, whether you're on our YouTube live or listening to us on Spotify or Apple. Thank Hit you guys. That like and subscribe button right Ooh, now. Yuli, you give it to him, baby. Let's go. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you next week.